Now I gotta wait till this goes live. Shit, I'm now fucking live. Now we're gonna change this to a. Let's do an eight millimeter. But no, we'll do it. We'll do it as docu or silver screen. Sepia. We'll just do it like we always have been with sepia or sepia or whatever the fuck. All right, cool. Because our ignorisms are usually traditionally in sepia or sepia, and I usually like to wear shades, so I'm going to be doing that too. Um, yeah. So, you know what? I, I'm not gonna do the shades. I'm not feeling it right now. Actually, my eyes don't feel strained, but they just feel bleh. So, I act. So today, I mean, you could tell by the title we're doing another. Ign I haven't done an ignorism in a while, so I thought we'd bring it back. And considering the recent passing of Anthony Bourdain, I thought this will be a really good, um, good a good um, topic to go into. There's a lot. I pulled a bunch of videos. I pulled a, a couple of quotes of his. Um, I pulled his Wikipedia page because we're going Wikipedia the show on this and whoa and it looks like no one is having a consensus on where he died because I saw Strasbourg, France and now it's like Kaysersberg, Vignoble, Haltrain, France but okay he only had one child and uh, two spouses both were uh, divorced um, you loved cooking in French, in French, but, yeah, we won't get, so for this, Signorism, we are going to just kind of go over everything. Um, he's definitely, uh, primarily, um, a chef from just what I'm looking at here, but we're not going to get really into, in, into much of that. We're, we'll mainly get into, uh, his worldview, which I, 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 I've got a pretty good amount here. But I'm also in the middle of everything. We'll continue to, uh, <clears throat> continue to, there we go. I was like, why is my uh, PC not connecting to both screens? But, oh, he has a lot of awards and nominations. I'll go over these awards uh, later at some point. He has his own bibliography, or bibliography. And uh, he's wrote some fiction, too, along with uh, nonfiction. Cool. Cool. So he's written a lot of fi not fiction and uh, five uh, fiction books, which is pretty cool. Didn't know that. <clears throat> no. So I'm going to pull up the article of where he died. I might as well just get into that since we're here. The latest chef recalls serving Bourdain Regional Fair. What? All times local, 12.40 a.m. Four days before his death, celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain was tucking into sauerkraut and roasted ham on the eastern French town of Colmar, just miles from the village of Kaysersburg, uh, where his life ended. Ju uh, Julian uh, Schroeder is the owner and chef of La Petite Venise. Uh, he said Friday that he served a typical regional meal to Bourdain and Eric Rippert, co-owner of New York's famed L uh, Le Bernardin, while cameras roll. Schroeder says the table of Americans didn't check uh, the menu, instead requesting what Mr. Bourdain is having. Hmm. Uh, Bourdain's body was discovered on Friday. He died of apparent suicide. So yeah, today. Today. Uh, Schroeder says Bourdain and Ripper didn't notice the cameras as they talked food, and he said he, uh, he feel that it came naturally. 8.20 p.m., a shopkeeper in the village of Red Roof, Dawson, France, uh, Alsace region, uh, where Anthony Bourdain apparently hanged himself, says he uh, saw a lot coming and going outside the luxury Deschambad Hotel. <clears throat> uh, 41-year-old uh, Christopher, Christophe, Christophe uh, Jolin says Friday morning uh, activity was unusual for Kaysberg. said armed police arrived, spoke... Uh, to a woman waiting outside, then entered uh, the hotel with her. Uh, he says vehicles came out and went to the next hour, clean more police vehicles. Damn, what the fuck? Damn, one of what's going on there. I guess they, that's when they discovered his body. Uh, Jolene believes the doctor arrived, presumably to declare the death. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, so it sounds like this is all due to the body discovery. 
Such commentation is rare for a scenic and ancient village with a population of less than 3,000 residents. It's a well-known spot on the famed wine route of uh, Ausles. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, let's just really get into just mainly... Yeah, it looks like it's just kind of going into a little bit of his basic background, which we'll be doing here in a sec anyway. So, Yeah, it looks like it's just kind of going into more into detail where he died at. So I guess it was... Uh, more closer to Kaysberg Vignoble. Is a commune in the Haute Rhin Department of Northeastern France. And it's a municipality which established on the 1st of January 2016. Huh, so it's like a little commune village just in the middle of France, basically. That's pretty interesting. Interesting indeed. Interesting indeed. Alright, well. Uh, I don't know which videos are which here, so this is the untold truth of Anthony Bourne. I won't go into that yet. Uh, oh, this is probably for the, it's probably for the kitty. This is for the kitty. Take the kitty. Pussy. Oh, oh God, okay, there you go. Oh, okay, if you come, you're going to have to start feeding in here, so I'm going to visit it all. Oh. Well, just feed her wherever. I don't care where. Here, out there, anywhere. But, all right, so let's see. I got a lot of different segments here, so I'm just going to kind of see what we got here. Mm. Got food, too. I'm hungry. So, fuck you. All right, Nancy Putin, anyways, so I'll, I'll definitely do that soon. So, the mom's will just kind of continue more about kind of some of the reactionary news of this before we get more into Anthony Bourdain. Um, but here is uh, one of my favorite people who I will do an ignorism at some point is Neil deGrasse Tyson. And ah, I got something in my eye now? What the fuck? Well, while I got something in my eye, here we go. Here is Neil deGrasse Tyson on Bourdain. Life is precious. Did you hear this news when you got here? Yeah, yeah, just just walked in and there the the news broke. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot about just the universe and and our curiosity manifested within it. And here is NASA and all of us collectively investing in a search for life on Mars. And we know implicitly, if not explicitly, that life is something precious. And wherever you find it, you cherish it and nurture it. So when we lose a life. Uh, particularly one that is lost tragically and not one of my natural causes, um, for, especially for me, but certainly for everyone, it, it hits that much more deeply mm, because yeah. there's so much effort that I know we spend in the search for life in the universe. And so, but at least we got to share this universe with him. He was on your show twice? Yeah, yeah, several times. Yeah, and he's a friend of the show, and we talked about the science of food. <laughs> um, and the relationship between culture and what foods you would eat or have the likelihood of eating, depending on where you were, what, what latitude you are on Earth, really? affects what kind of foods you I'm eat. actually going to find that now. I want to look that up because that sounds interesting. Because, um, yeah, let me go, go here. Uh, let me figure that out. Let me uh, pull off to the side here. That sounds so interesting. I want to. I want to find that. I, I'm going to find that right now. I want. I'm. We're we're, we're going to sidetrack on that because that's cool. Because I did say I want to kind of get into a little bit of everything about him. So might as well get into the science of cooking with him. You know. So let's look up Neil deGrasse Tyson with Anthony Bourdain. Okay, here we go. Hopefully we'll find. We'll we'll find what I'm looking for here. Oh, here we go. It's a 34-minute thing. I'm probably not going to play the whole thing, but, well, at least... It... <laughs> okay, my you, I, uh, my uh, thing did not want to cooperate right, whatever. At least my, um, at least uh, for my uh, connection, it's okay. Is everyone drunk yet? No one is drunk yet, sir. I'm actually quite so. I haven't even smoked yet. Like I came home, had some food. I'm still eating that food. I had some food, and I haven't smoked yet. I'm about to do that here. So, anyway, we're talking on, of course, Anthony Bourdain. Um, doing an ignorance. What about Jaeger bombs? I don't know about Jaeger bombs. 
And I'm getting a phone call right now. Dude, what the fuck? I'm sorry, bitch, but decline. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I don't want that vibration annoying the shit out of everything. If I answer, oh, god damn it. See, this is what happens. This is what happens. I should have just let that play on. I'm not gonna answer. It was actually a TK. <laughs> it was TK. He's gonna be like, the fuck? He, like, declined my thing. What the hell? See, if, his, if he had data on his phone, or just had Wi-Fi or something, and he was able to stream, he would just be chilling in, in the chat or something instead. But then he'll be able to actually understand what's going on. I know what Jaeger bombs are. There's shots of it. I knew that. I know this. I know what a Jaeger bomb is. I've had Jaegermeister before. I mean, it's been a very long time since I've had Jaegermeister, but I've had it before. But anyway, um, I guess uh, because um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking about how Anthony Bourdain was on his show, which I pulled up now, uh, one of the instances, and uh, they talk about uh, some of the science on food, which I uh, really want to check out because that sounds interesting. Because I love food, you know, I love cooking, I love checking out new different foods. Like I've ha I've actually straight up had Ethiopian food before, because um, there used to be uh, somebody from Ethiopia who worked at um, at our store and straight up just had like raw Ethiopian food, not like literally raw, but you know what I mean. It's and it was good. It's like damn. It's like, you Ethiopians know how to eat. It's like, why don't you have an abundance of this? <laughs> we need to, like, get you guys to get an abundance of this stuff. It's delicious. But anyway, anyway, let's get into uh, at least, like, a little bit of a segment. Just kind of check it out. So I'll just kind of skip in the middle and see what we got going. Oh, here we go. Uh, a lot of people in this world look at ingredients that many of us would probably have difficulty with. It's, that's an attitude that changes really quickly. Um, the more you travel, you know, that, that mm. something I got over very quickly, particularly, you know, you talk about, wow, their food in Thailand is really, you know, repulsive to me and they eat bugs, but the Thais who are largely a non-dairy culture, you know, try to put yourself in their shoes. They're looking at us, uh, you know, eat a cottage cheese or Roquefort would be truly <laughs> horrifying. If you think about it for a second, what that must look like. Yeah, I definitely see that. I mean, I haven't traveled the world yet. I am going to start that um, this year. But, yeah, man, I mean, yeah, like, to try other different foods and different cultures. Like, uh, one thing I love about Portland and food carts and stuff is that you're able to kind of get a taste, you know, kind of like a teaser of different cultural food bases. And usually there's a lot of Thai, there's a lot of Mexican um and a little bit of European blends, like uh, Italian to German to Scandinavian. You know, you can just find all sorts of ins and outs. And it's all like, if you open yourself up to it, it ends up being really good. And you're able to expand your horizons on just food. And since I've been doing that myself, even um, the past couple of years, I can definitely say it opens up your, op not options, but opens up your variety of options that you enjoy to actual foods. Because... I used to not like cheese, straight up. Oh, you guys, so you're calling them all? Well, you have fun with that, because I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> but, yeah, man. Um, uh, but, yeah, with, like, food carts, food and stuff, like, because of that, I've actually grown to enjoy more, some cheeses, actually, and I personally hate cheese. I just, I'm not lactose intolerant or nothing, I just don't. But I've grown to actually like certain goat cheeses and some Havarti cheeses, like, I mean, um, and I'm open. I'm opened up to cheddar now at this point. So, I mean, there's there, there's definitely, like, a thing uh, for that. It's like a sociological science behind it, uh, for sure. I mean, because, I mean, what brings to, what brings people together better than food? I mean, for real. Like, if you bring, if you, like, want to have a meeting or something, bring some food. Because everyone's going to, everyone is down for food, dude. Everybody is down for some food. Everyone's down for some food. <laughs> yeah man I you know despite me not being like not under not knowing who Anthony Bourdain truly was that much I mean um yeah I mean I'm, I'm still definitely just like damn you know like wow like someone is cool and as amazing as this guy was and you know shit but, yeah, where was that whole thing I was going back? There it is. What do you find interesting, though, is 
you go from one country to the next. And one of the simplest measures of this is what is the assortment of flavors that they infuse in their potato chips? That they're selling, for example, right? I mean, you know, so it, it, in Japan they have like fish yes. flavored potato chips. This, I mean, we eat fish here, mm -hmm. but I don't know that that would sell. There's a whole spectrum, there are whole spectrums of flavors that other countries, other cultures uh, uh, take for granted and, and require in their diet. Uh, the Philippines, there's a whole uh, bitter component that we are almost instinctively not happy with. I mean, they will, they will introduce bile into dishes to give it a, that welcome bitter note. There's a tradition of really? rotting things, like fermenting fish getting it really offensively funky by our standards, just because, I think, out of boredom. It introduces another flavor. And it's worth noting also that we, the Western societies, I and mean, we used to, uh, used to do that. In Roman times, the condiment of choice was essentially something called garum. It was essentially rotten fish guts and rotten fish sauce. Uh. This was the, the salt, the principal seasoning ingredient all across Europe. So even our own taste. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean... Food tastes definitely are extremely subjective beyond any reality, realistic comprehension. Because everyone has different uh, forms of taste, and I did not know that. Like back in the Roman times, uh, seasoning and spice was basically fermented fish guts. Like, ugh. <laughs> like what the hell? <laughs> like, and you know, take it into context of what he was saying earlier with like, uh people in Thailand um, who don't have hardly any dairy in their diet and they look at like cottage cheese and milk and shit here and they're like the fuck <laughs> and I mean and yet we look at some for, for me like looking at the Romans in their seasons of fermented fish juice and shit <laughs> like I'm just like what the fuck <laughs> it's like no nah, man but I mean I mean, let me go back to uh, an actual example when I did try some of that Ethiopian food from um, uh, my coworker, uh, my ex coworker, I guess, actually, because he doesn't work there anymore. But um, he, uh, uh, there was something in there that I noticed, and it kind of threw me off. I don't remember what it really was. I think it was part of the Ethiopian um, um, fluffy bread that they have. It's like it's a specific, specific like form of bread i don't even want to like try to remember what it was called um but there's something in there that like hmm, 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 hmm. like you know i couldn't like to tell if i liked it or not you know what i mean so i mean yeah it's, i mean there is definitely a science behind food but i think if no matter what if you if you get like you know fat pot of food and they bring and you know someone else brings a fat pot of fruit and never met it before. You you sit them down together, try some food out to each other. I mean, it's just what you know people do all the time now. I mean, we have gatherings, we have feasts, we have buffets. I mean, you know what? Nothing brings people together more than food. I am that is one of my hardline beliefs. And damn it, we should win. You know, you know proposal. And I think I know how to uh, win the. Uh, Summit deal with Kim Jong Un, food. <laughs> he's he's a pudgy motherfucker, so he's gonna be happy with anything. Like give him, give him like a freaking steak dinner, <laughs> and give him like, like sushi rolls or some shit, and then um, and then like just to kind of uh, do a little kind of like a curveball was just throw some like straight venison, I don't know, or turkey, I, I or something. And be like, here, try this. And then they bring their just a tiny bowl of rice. Cause that's all they serve. <laughs> and, um, it, you know, it's, I don't know. You get my point. I mean, I'm making a joke with that. But, I mean, overall, yeah. Most definitely that. There's so, This is cool. This is an awesome talk. I, I'm going to be. This is great. I like this. I didn't realize that Anthony Bourdain was on Star Talk with the Grass Tyson. Because I watch Star Talk all the time. I love Star Talk. Oh, here's uh, something else on Anthony Bourdain on food. Let's actually uh, switch into this, because this looks interesting, because uh, the title is uh, Anthony Bourdain on food. There's nothing more political. That's really interesting. So I'd love to actually uh, listen in on what he thinks on this. Well, thank you so much for coming in. It's, uh, it's great to see you. 
to what extent? So I think overall how the Signarism is going is I'm starting with food. Got to get it. You guys are start. I'm eating food right now. You might as well start with food, you know. But anyway, let's uh, get right back into it. This is from uh, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Network. So anyway, that's where you can find this. But I mean, there's so much on Anthony Bourdain. I mean, there's going to be so many different sources, links, articles, and all sorts of shit that are plopped out everywhere. But I think I might uh, make like separate playlists for all my ignorisms where I kind of find everything. And um, and I'll kind of plop them uh as like a public thing so you can all can kind of see where I was looking at stuff because I don't delete these tabs on here not at least until later but anyway I'm gonna talk on this or n not talk on this but shut up so I can talk on it later that is wow the, the best or maybe least biased glimpse into how a society a country and economy works well there's nothing more political there's nothing more revealing of, of the real situation on the ground whether a system works or not I mean Whatever your philosophical, uh, the foundation of your personal belief system, uh, it's difficult to spend time in Cuba, particularly like 10 years ago, uh, eat with ordinary people and come out of it thinking, uh, wow, this system's really working out for everybody. Uh, who gets to eat, who doesn't get to eat, uh, what they're eating. I mean, the food itself on the plate is usually the end result of a very long and often very painful story. I mean, there's a lot of food preservations, there's a lot of pickling. Um, in mm -hmm. certain countries, their cuisine very much reflects either a siege mentality or uh, abundance or intermittent periods of difficulty. Uh, also, people just, if you, if you go in not as a journalist, but just as somebody who's asking simple questions like, what do you like to eat? What makes you happy? People tend to drop their defenses and tell you extraordinary things that, that they're very revealing. And, and where do you get this stuff? I mean, the, 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 the production chain and how you get all this food oh, tells you so much about how an economy functions, isn't it? Well, I think the, the, maybe the strongest example of... Okay, before we continue, this thing is somewhat clogged in this fucking perk in here, so I'm going to change the water really quick. Um, I'm just going to... What can I play over this so it's not just utter fucking silence, you know what I mean? Um, fuck. Okay, hold up. I'm just going to play royalty-free beats. How about that? Actually, I know who I could play because I know it ain't going to be uh, fucked. I ain't going to get fucked over this. So, hold up. Hold up. Let's get some boom in the fridge. Uh... Fuck, what's a good song that I can play? What is a good song that I can play by good old Billy? Okay. Fuck it, I'll play this song. It'll just be quiet, not not major. Nothing in ma super. It's just in the background, so... It's not... It's, I'm gonna be, like, less than a minute here. It's like, it's gotta change this water. Anyway, I'll be right back. Very shortly, I promise. I promise you. Probably want to. Might as well. Be back soon. Elevate and fuck the rest. I got something I should get up off my chest. If you will 
would invest in a bulletproof vest. Yeah, we don't like you. We would like to fight you. Exit stage left. Here's a window you can fly through. You be me, please. You can really try to. That'll happen just like Gatsby rapping without white dudes. <laughs> Took longer than a minute. We have this freaking like little grate in the middle of the hallway so our dogs don't like decide that they need to like do some terrorism amongst the cats. And I can't even fucking like climb over the bitch. It's like it was so freaking high up. Like my I don't know if you heard it or not, but you could probably hear what that was going on. And I was just like, fucking hell, really? I can't just like casually just whatever, but anyway, get back into some of this delicious food. Get back into uh, this uh, video on political food. <laughs> but I'll take this hit while I'm getting into it. Might as well elevate. We might as well do a little elevation. Climb the peaks of uh, Budvest or something. Budvest. Instead of Everest, we got Budvest or Weed. Read a vest. I don't know. I'm trying to. I'm trying to make it work, but it wasn't. Snuck up on us when we were shooting in Egypt uh, before the Arab Spring. We wanted to shoot a scene with uh, food, which is the everyday sort of food of your know, working class uh, Cairo. And our fixers and local translators suddenly were all up in arms. No, no, no! You must not shoot this. You can't shoot food. He said, "Wait, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere." It's not interesting. He said, no, we really like to shoot it. I said, it's forbidden. We'll kick you out. We ended up getting the shot anyway through various <laughs> devious strategies. But I think what they were concerned about was they understood that it's not just typical. It's all there is to eat. The army controlled, the, I guess, the flour supply. There have been bread riots. And uh, they were not so much worried about how it would look outside of the country, but the show is aired within the country. And I didn't think they wanted their own people seeing it. Yeah. Uh, Particularly after an episode of the same show shot in France. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, um, you fly into a country, especially for this show, where you're trying to sort of understand a new place. You're trying to, to explain a new place to, to, to viewers like us. When you go to a place for the first time, you get off the plane, you go downtown, do you go high-end food? Do you go street meat? Where no, it's uh, what's most typical. A good starting point is always the market, early morning market. See what's seasonal, what's available. Or what people are buying. Also, there are usually little like, food stalls that are serving people who work in the market. Uh, people talk to you in environments. So. If I ever go to, uh, when I do go to Iceland, I definitely want to see if they have like a little food market. Like, I want to go to a village and just go to a local food market and just buy some local, just look, just a couple local things, you know? I know I can't take it back with me, but shit, I'm going to try whatever they got there, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be great going there. I mean, to ch check out the world and see, you know, the, it, it's amazing how food. I mean, it's kind of weird how this ignorism is mostly about food right now. But I mean, yeah, it, it's food really brings people together, man. I mean, it does. Regardless if you agree with them or not, you can at least talk over it while you're eating. I mean, because that makes you feel good, you know, builds your belly. Releases a little bit of dopamine, I th I'm pretty sure. Like a little bit, because you're like, ah, I got some food. Mm -hmm. Well. That, uh, generally in a good mood, open to try out their English, if, it, if that's interesting to them. Uh, yeah, I'm not interested in high-end restaurants in general, unless it's something really unusual and extraordinary and new uh, that says something in and of itself. That there's an emerging oak cuisine in, in Mexico, for instance. That's really interesting to me. But generally speaking, no, that's not what I'm looking at first. And uh, again, the markets sort of help you understand, you know, uh, you know, we were talking about Gaza off air, that it's, you know, the, the fishing is the, the primary thing. It's going to, you know, the fish are coming in. That's how people are making their living. That's how people yeah. are sort of trading and making, making but, their way in the world. as they will, you know, as soon as you're at the fish market, uh, well, they're getting their fish two ways. Within the one mile, I think it's a yeah. mile limit. Because if they go beyond a mile, they risk uh, getting their boat sank. Yeah. Uh, or through the tunnels from uh, from Egypt. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, you know already 
the subject is fraught with, with peril. Um, yeah. It's uh, extremely controversial, but it's the sort of thing that on my show, uh, I get to comment on it. Just stick with food, man. You know, we don't want to hear politics from you. You're a chef. You know, shut up. We don't want your political opinion. And that's where I disagree. At least what, I mean, not him, but with uh, people saying, uh, claims that like, oh, you're, you're a food person. Don't, you, you know, you, you do, uh, you have a food show. You, you keep politics out of it. It's like, how can you though? You know, I mean, sure you can, of course. You could just talk about the cuisine itself. But if you are traveling the world and stuff, it's, you know, you're, you're getting the chance to learn about who, who they are and trying out their food, you know? Um, I mean, it's not even about just trying the food and shit, but I mean, if you, you know, tr seeing the world like he has and to understand more of maybe not their perils, but just who, you know, what they are and who people um, are in these places and realize, you know, they're just everyday people too, you know, in the just most generalized sense. And, the, you know, in these markets is probably the best way to just, you know, see what the culture truly is, you know? I mean, it's, it's cool. I mean, wow. You know, I, it, like I said, I, um, oh shit. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a comment here that said a year ago, it says Bourdain for president, but now there's like, um, comments just popping out now saying, oh, well, there's a change of plan. He, he's sort of dead. And, yeah, but it's just like, damn, dude. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, I love how food just really does, how for him, food was, uh, well, well, fucking Wikipedia is popping up some stupid notification, get out of here, um, anyway, uh, yeah, but, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to see, uh, how he was able to, um, uh, use food in a sense to kind of open up you know maybe not his own worldview because he probably had you know his view already which is kind of part maybe part of the reason why he uh used uh food as um one of his uh, main focal points to bring this out i mean because he he is definitely primarily just from what i can see here uh uh, not just specifically known for his uh, cooking and being a chef, but it seems like that's where a lot of his um, life uh, began. But might as well go into his early life really, uh, really quick because it looks like there's a lot of really cool, interesting stuff here. So, I mean, let me just uh, read this tiny little snippet. Well, it's not really a tiny snippet, but I mean, it's like one pretty juicy paragraph on it. <clears throat> Get that burp out of the way. I'm, I'm gonna drink this tea really quick before I do so. Before I do so, I'm gonna drink this tea. Ah, yum. Tea. Anyway. Anyway, here it is. Quote Anthony Bourdain, known as his friends as Tony, was born June 25th, 1956, in New York City and grew up in uh, Leonia, New Jersey. His parents were Pierre Bourdain, um, a classical music industry executive for Columbia Records. And Gladys uh, Bourdain, Ne Saxman, I guess, uh, was a staff editor for the New York Times. So his uh, parents, uh, looks like, were already fairly uh, recognized within... Uh, in, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm hearing my mom. She's like, oh, what the hell? Shut up! I just woke her up. God damn. Those fucking dogs. Anyway, um... So it looks like his parents were uh, already fairly um, comfortable, had comfortable uh, living statuses with their jobs because one of them was a industry executive uh, for classical music for Columbia Records and Gladys uh, Bourdain, which I'm assuming is his uh, father, was a staff editor for the New York Times. So he already had a pretty, uh, parents who already had some relatively uh, decent lives so far. And his younger brother, Christopher, became a currency analyst. So even he was able, uh, even his brother was, uh, uh, grew up to do something uh, comfortable, you know, have a comfortable uh, job of his life and his career. <clears throat> but we're not talking about his brother, Christopher, so I don't care. Well, I do, but I don't. And made appearances on some TV, on some of his own TV shows. So his brothers also appeared on the show, too. 
Uh, Bordine said he was raised without religion and that his family was Catholic on his father's side but and Jewish on his mother's. His parental grandparents were French. His parental grandfather immigrated from Arcachon. is a commune in uh, the southwestern France Department of Gironde. I'm really... Uh, Gironde? Gironde? I'm, I'm, I'm not good at French, okay? So... D d d Please, <laughs> don't roast me for my horrible French. Arshon, I guess, is probably how it will be more pronounced. To uh, Immigrate from uh, Arshon to New York following World War One. So his uh, uh, grandfather fled um, to New York after World War One, presuming to probably just escape the war and not get involved in the conflict. And his father grew up speaking French and spent many summers in France. Uh, Bourdain was a Boy Scout growing up, too. So, might as well just kind of go briefly over his, uh, um, culinary career really quick. It's kind of interesting that, um, he said uh, he wasn't raised, he was raised without religion, even though he was, had a Catholic father and a Jewish mother. So, it's kind of interesting, I guess it's just because they both, considering that they, um, a Catholic married a Jew, um, which isn't honestly weird, because, I mean, um, my mom, uh, w um, had a very, very, um, close relationship with an Iranian man, but, um, he wasn't religious himself, but he grew up, of, of course, in, um, a Shia, uh, Shia Islamist-based, uh, culture and lifestyle, and, um, this was also going on during, um, um, during Iran's, Multi, you know, the turmoil going on uh, with uh, Shah. I, I don't know all the like where the timelines fit with him uh, versus uh, Iran's uh, political turmoil. But I mean, we could pro it's, if I uh, talk to mom about the story again and uh, maybe it's. I can't really say too much because I mean it's obviously a personal story, especially to my mom, but. I mean, the dude, I mean, um, he is a professor in uh, videography, I think, at University of Toronto. So he spent a lot of his time mostly uh, mostly on um, his uh, uh, career as uh, becoming that professor later on in life, which he is now. And my mom's even found uh, some videos of him, stu you know, being a professor, you know, teaching classes. It it's cool. I mean, I was even, even able to see him how it is now, so... Um, don't know much about that guy, but he seems, uh, I forgot his name, but I'm not gonna buff, flop it out here anyway, but, um, yeah. He seemed like a really interesting guy, though, and it's kind of cool that, you know, he was able, that his parents kind of understood that, you know, we shouldn't force a religion, especially since there's two conflicting uh, beliefs in a religion, so, makes sense, uh, considering that, and, um, and also, it just seems like that's a very common thing I notice, is that um, people with different religions don't seem to give a shit that their spouse is a different religion. I don't know how common it is, but it seems like it's fairly common. Um, let me see here. So, uh, Bourdain attended the Culinary Institute of America, graduating in 78. Uh, from there, he went on to run various restaurant kitchens in New York City, including a Supper Club, 1 Fifth Avenue, and Sullivan's. In 98, Bourdain became an executive chef at Brasile uh, Le Halle, based in Manhattan, uh, with additional locations at the time in Miami, uh, D.C., and Tokyo. He remained executive chef there for many years, and even when no longer formally employed at Les Halles, uh, he maintained a relationship with the restaurant where he described in 2014, in January, as a chef at large after bankruptcy. Uh, the Halles closed in 2017. Damn. It would have been really cool to... Ch I was just thinking, like, hey, I kind of want to um, check that out. But, yeah. So, uh, from here on, it goes into his media career, which I'm... I mean, I'll just kind of... I won't go over all the major shit going on, but um, I will kind of uh, just read off what he was doing. So, from like, uh, so his first uh, series as a host was a Cook's Tour from 2002 to 2003. It ran for 35 episodes, um, which, uh, well, I'm just reading up here, um, the census is so small, I'm just might as well read it. The acclaim surrounding Bourdain's memoir, Kitchen Confidential, led to an offer by the Food Network for him to host his own food and world travel show, A Cook's Tour. 
and everything else I just stated. So uh, his next show was No Reservations, and this was from 20, uh, 2005 to 2012. And, um, and it was fairly a similar series, uh, and this was on the Travel Channel. And as a further result of the immense popularity of Kitchen's Confidential, the Fox sitcom Kitchen Confidential aired on 2005, which characters Jack Bourdain is based, loosed basically on his biography and persona. Hmm, didn't know that. In uh, 2006, blah, blah, blah. Uh, oh, uh, he, oh, so here's something kind of important, actually. In uh, 2006, he, his, he and his crew in uh, Beirut uh, filming an episode of No Reservations when the uh, Israel-Lebanon conflict broke out unexpectedly after the crew had filmed only a few hours of footage for the food and travel show. His producers uh, complied behind-the-scenes footage of him and his production staff, including not only their initial attempts to film the episode, but their first-hand encounters with Hezbollah supporters. Huh. Uh, their days of, of awaiting for news on the other... Uh, exasperates uh, in the Beirut Hotel and the eventual escape aided uh, fixer in Unseen Footage, whom uh, Bourdain uh, dubbed Mr. Wolf after Harvey Kettle's uh, character in Pulp Fiction. Bourdain and his uh, crew were finally evacuated with other American citizens on the morning of Jan July 20th by the USMC. The Beirut uh, No Revisations episode, which aired in 2006 Fox 21st, was nominated for an Emmy Award. Wow. So, um, I'm going to probably have to check out this episode specifically, because, I mean, you know, being a world traveler, especially um, a, a chef doing, a, um, someone who's inspired with cooking, um, doing world travel, I think this, I think um, maybe this might have been kind of the thing that kind of planted the seed of using this essentially gateway for uh towards people uh people's interests especially with food and uh traveling world traveling it was probably an opportunity for them to uh kind of open up more into what was going on um actually i don't know i kind of do but don't know about the lebanon war the 2006 lebanon war which is what happened <clears throat> I'm just going to go in here quickly. I'm not going to go into it deeply. but It was a 34-day military conflict in Lebanon, northern Israel, in the Golan Heights. Postal parties with Hezbollah, paramilitary forces, and the IDF. Uh, the conflict started in 2006 on July 12th and continued until the UN broker ceasefire went into effect on the morning of uh, the 14th of August 2006. So two days before my birthday. That's cool. That's cute. Uh, though it... Formally ended on the September 8th, 2006, when Israel lifted a naval blockade of Lebanon. Um, due to unprecedented Iranian military support to Hezbollah before the war and during the war, some considered the first round of the Iran-Israel proxy conflict. Tch, fuck, dude. Rather than a continuation of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Yeah. I, yeah, I would probably consider that one of the first rounds of the Iranian-Israeli conflict proxy wars because i mean that's been i mean honestly that's probably been going on for a very long time but i could probably see this as being like israel's kind of independent move on their uh, proxy wars conflict but i won't i mean i mean you could see how deep i can get into it just based on uh anthony bordine's travels and learning about him so yeah, I mean, overall, I'm not going to get into this, though I think at some point when I start getting into it, I keep saying I want to start getting into, like, doing historical conflicts and shit about, um, about stuff like this and just other stuff, too, but I haven't started it yet. And the main th reason why is just because I don't know what would be a good name for the segment, so... I'm going to eventually just do them anyway, just regardless of, you know, the fucking name of the segment, so, yeah, but anyway, it's a tangent that's not related, but uh, I'm going to go down here again into The Layover, which was in 2011 to 2013, and it was on the Travel Channel as well, and um, it'll be, and um, this one's also short, so I'll just go into this. Uh, the Travel Channel announced in July 2011 that it will be adding a second one-hour, ten-episode Bourdain show to be titled The Layover, which premiered on the 21st of November uh, that same year. Each episode featured an exploration of a city that could be undertaken with an air travel layover of 24 to 48 hours. The series ran for 20 episodes through February of 2013. 
And here's his major thing that um, that has been his big thing is Parts Unknown, which was from 2013, basically until his death of 2018. So um, I won't. So it started in May two. Uh, well, in May 2012. Bourdain announced that he would be leaving uh, the Travel Channel. In December, uh, he explained on his blog that the departure was due to his frustration with the channel's new ownership, using his voice and image to make it seem like he, if he was endorsing a car brand. And the, Oh my god. And the channel's creating three special episodes, uh, consisting solely of clips from the seven official episodes of that season. He went on to host the, uh, Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, for CNN. The program focuses on other cuisines, cultures, and politics, uh, and premiered in April uh, 14th, 2013. So, I mean, this is probably where he also was getting, maybe not backlash, but just kind of lash at, like, uh, why are you being political when you're, you know, focusing on food and other weird cultures and stuff? And the way I see it, it's just like... I mean, maybe that's a, maybe that's a good thing, and I kind of, you know, kind of went into it. But overall, I mean, in a more detailed sense, like yeah, I think so because, like I said, you know, food brings people together, and trying out new foods, experimenting with uh, what you might like or not like, uh, you know, just trying out new stuff. And getting to actually meet people more and able to have just casual conversation before you, you get into politics or whatever you're going to get into. Um, or maybe that's just all you're doing. It's just doing some side chat. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's like, so what if it gets political? I mean, it's on CNN, for one. So you should expect it to be at least a little political. And that I don't think that's a bad thing. If anything, that's a honestly kind of a really good... Um, or at least a really interesting, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, interesting, um, gate, uh, not gateway, uh, interesting, god damn it, whatever. Uh, interesting, it's interesting. <laughs> it's an interesting way to get your message out. Because most people don't expect cuisines or, um, will travel uh, and looking into food of different uh, places uh, to be a very, um, to be a very, uh, uh, just to be the way to uh, get politics into it. Most people aren't expecting it, but you can, and I think, you know, you should have. And I think and I think it was a very, a very interesting way for him to do it. And final thing is, President Obama was featured on the program in an episode filmed in Vietnam that aired in September 2016. And as of 2017, the show has been sent places such as Libya, Tokyo, Punjab, Jamaica, Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Armenia. So, he's been all over the world, man. Yeah, I mean, there, it gets in a little bit more about him here, but I'm not, there's a bunch of other different stuff, but I'm, I won't go into that, because it looks like he's done other series and animations. He's been on Nick Jr. before. Uh, the Simpsons, it looks like. Um... Started a food blog, The Three Mouth Um was on the uh, uh, was featured in a, a episode of Archer season four episode seven, and he was basically just doing a parody of himself. That's pretty cool. So he's done. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to just his like um, celebrity status, he was able to really use that. For sure, especially to get into all these other shows. Like, I'm I'm not the biggest fan of uh, Archer, but I like it. It's a pretty cool show. Um, uh, personal life. Just getting into his life a little bit. Whoa. Okay, I actually didn't know this. I'll get into his last little segment that it gets into here. So it says a former user of cocaine, heroin, and LSD. Fuck. <laughs> Damn. Very interesting combination, dude. I wonder what he started with. Maybe it was in this order. He started with cocaine, somehow switched to heroin, and probably took LSD. Was like, bro, what the fuck am I doing with my life? <laughs> I, I I think that's how, what the order may be. I have no idea. In Kitchen Confidential, he wrote that of his experience in a trendy Shoho restaurant in 81. We were high all the time, sneaking off to walk in refrigerator at every op uh, opportunity to conceptualize hardly a decision was made without drugs cannabis methoqualone 
cocaine, LSD, psilocybin mushrooms soaked in honey to use to sweeten tea, he, and used to sweeten tea, uh, psychobarotol, wh what? Um, tunial, uh, amphetamine, codeine, and increasingly heroin, which he'd send a Spanish-speaking busboy over Alphabet City to get. Holy fuck. Damn. He had a pretty, uh, wild life. He's been known for being an unrepentant uh, drinker and smoker in a nod to Bourdain at the time, two-pack-a-day cigarette habit. Renault chef uh, Thomas Keller once served him a 20-course tasty menu, which included a meal of coffee and cigarette, the coffee custard infused with tobacco. Whoa. Together with uh, Foy Gras Mosse, Bourdain stopped cigarette smoking in the summer 2007 for the sake of his daughter. Well, that's good, man. I mean, because, yo, I mean, fucking... Tobacco and cigarettes, especially just cigarettes in general, are just so toxic. Like, I mean, in general, uh, like, tobacco is just not good for you at all. I mean, you know, at this point, there's ways to, uh, you know, get that nicotine high without killing yourself in the process. Because the nicotine itself isn't what fucks your lungs and your body up it's everything that they put in there with uh the tobacco and shit and just that in general but yeah man it's damn i didn't know uh, that he was uh into drugs as much as he was but that's really interesting man i i've kind of find that interesting like he i mean he didn't do just that cocaine heroin lsd uh he was doing uh marijuana mushrooms I meth, I guess, because methaquolone, like, what was this? I sold under the brand name of Quaaludes. Oh, Quaaludes. Okay, so it's Quaaludes. So that's what a methaquolone is, is Quaaludes. Okay. Um, sector, uh, sector barotol sodium is a derivative dr 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 drug. It was, uh, whatever. Uh, don't know what this duh. It has, a. Uh, in, uh, anesthetic, it possesses anesthetic, anticonvulsant, anti, uh, anxiolytic, sedative, and hypnotic properties, huh, and tuniol, which is a combination drugs, uh, two tuberotide salts in equal portions, whoa, amphetamine, um, uh, is a potent central nervous system stimulant, which is for ADHD for the most part, so he was doing all sorts of shit, back in the 80s, man. I mean, that was all, I mean, that was the drug craze era at the time, too, the 70s and 80s. I mean, it still is. It still is today. It always has been. It's just that, you know, if, I guess around that time, it just got, uh, big. Interest and in, uh, advocacy. Uh, so we're about to get into his interest here. Um, uh, he had, uh, Bourdain advocated uh, for communicating the value of traditional or, quote, peasant foods. Huh. And overall, that's just dishes, as dishes that are specific to a particular culture, which, you know, it's like I I, I see the uh, advocation of the value I, I I see the value of like traditional foods because I love, you know, exploring different traditional foods. Like if I ever get that opportunity to try something unique and different that's like derived from a specific culture, I'm in. I mean, I've done it before. I mean, I like I said, I've tried Ethiopian food before. I've tried Thai, uh, Scandinavian, uh, Vietnamese, uh, what else? I mean, uh, Hispanic, all sorts of food. I mean, I don't even know what specifics I can even uh, get into on that. But anyway, uh, going back in this, it says, including all the varietal bits and unused animal parts not usually eaten by affluent 21st century U.S. citizens. Hmm. Um, he also championed the quality of freshly prepared street food in other countries, especially developing countries, compared to fast food chains in the U.S. Oh, my God. Dude, okay. I'm going to say this now. I trust the healthiness of some random peasant's food in, like, I don't know, Kenya or Malaysia or some shit compared to McDonald's. Like, oh, my God. I couldn't agree with that more, to be honest. Like... These fast food chains in the U.S., I mean, some of them are okay, but so many of them are just so, oh my god, what? It's like, it's just edible f wannabe food that's just edible. I mean, there's not a lot of health properties to it because there's so many 
negative um, impacts that it makes on your own body. Like, oh my, it's so bad for you, dude. I, I don't even eat fast food anymore. I've made that decision a long time ago. Like, the only fast food I really eat nowadays is probably Chick-fil-A. And that's not even that often. That's like once a month. And that's because my mom loves Chick-fil-A because, you know, that was her big thing in the South back in the day. So, I mean, you can't help but, you know, notice when there's Chick-fil-A in the house. You're just like, I'm getting some Chick-fil-A. Gotta get that Chick-fil-A. And um, another one, if Whataburger was in the Northwest, like Whataburger, that would probably be one I would consistently go to. Like, like the only fast food I can make any exceptions for is probably Chick-fil-A and Whataburger. Honestly, I can't really make any other exceptions because I, I just don't, it's just like, eh. I mean, like, I don't even remember the last time I really actually made my own conscious decision to go inside a fast food place to go get something, you know what I mean? I think the last time I did, it was probably at a Wendy's or a Jack in a Box or a uh, Burger King, but I can't remember which one because it's been that long. Like, I don't go into these places anymore because it's just, eh. I'd much rather have, like, street food or food cart food or anything that ain't fast food chains in the U.S. So, yeah. It, me and Bardeen would get along quite well. <laughs> uh, he championed industrious Spanish-speaking immigrants from Mexico, Ecuador, etc., who are cooks and chefs in many U.S. restaurants, including upscale restaurants, regardless of cuisine. That's true. I mean, I've no, especially uh, there's um, a place called Super Burrito just right down the street from me. And it's a family uh, ran, um, it's a Mexican family ran re uh, little restaurant that's been there all the, for long as, my brother's lived here longer than I have, and it's been there since he's been here. <laughs> and he's like 30 now, and um, when he was my age, it was still there. So like, at least 20 years ago, to 21 to 25 years ago, that Super Burrito's always been there. So I mean, it's probably been there even longer than that. And it's just always been ran by this one family or at least uh there's always a family running it so it, it's it's good shit it's good quality food regardless of cuisine because honestly there's something about mexican and uh, hispanic and latin american um chefs and cooks that th they got like they got something tapped in their brain that just gives them the passion to cook or something like there's something just unique about how they do their cooking regardless of cuisine they just are good with it. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't understand it. I don't know. I don't question it. They just make it really good. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah. He considers them talented chefs and invaluable cooks, underpaid and unrecognized, even though they have become the backbone of the U.S. restaurant industry. Oh yeah. I mean, the rest. You know, honestly, it's really sad what the restaurant industry and what um. A, I mean, just mainly the main chains. I'm not talking like a local family restaurant because, like, they actually are far more recognized in that sense compared to, like, Red Robin, for example. Just no shit in our Red Robin. I actually like Red Robin. I like to go there every now and then. But, I mean, I'm just picking a random fast food, or not fast food, but like a big, you know, gourmet restaurant chain. And, unfortunately, a lot of chefs, a lot of, you know, these valuable um cooks, waiters, and, you know, restaurant industry workers just get underpaid and highly under unrecognized. And there's even this law in Oregon that recently passed where it's hoping to um, bolster the recognition and the pay for a lot of people who work in the restaurant bar industry. But I'll actually have to get into that because it's it's a very, very weird bill, and I'll have to really get into it. Um, so at some point, I'll get into that at some point. I don't know why I said at some point twice in one sentence. Whatever. But in 2017, Bourdain became a vocal advocate against central sexual harassment in restaurants and Hollywood, in partic particularly following his partner Asia um, Ar Argento's sexual abuse allegations against Harvey Weinstein. Damn. Bourdain accused Hollywood director Quentin Tarantino of, compli of complicity uh, with the Weinstein sex scandal. Damn. But, yeah, so, I'm just going to delve into one conspiracy that's already exploded since uh, the shit's been going on. And there's a conspiracy that Harvey Weinstein hired, oh god, he's such a fat, ugly fuck. Such trash, man. He's a trashy man, oh my god. I mean, did, 
like, there's a weird, retarded conspiracy where they're saying that Harvey Weinstein offed fucking, or, or had, um, um, inf or just was able to, like, pay somebody or was, a, a, you know, a, had a hand in the death of uh, Bourdain by, like, making his suicide look like, mur uh, um, actually be a murder or something. It's just like, what the fuck? Shut the fuck up. Like, Harvey Weinstein being complicit in his death. Really? <laughs> really, people? It, it's it's just hilarious, but so stupid at the same time. It's honestly just an insult to his own death, especially it literally being, like, at least a day or two old now. It's like, come on. But... Anyway, I mean, I, th I think we went in a pretty good amount of interesting facts about him here. Um, so I'll get out of that page, because I still have another page of that up anyway. And I'll get into uh, some more um, videos here. I'll go into, um, let's actually kind of get into uh, something uh, that Democracy Now! Uh, uploaded. Um, because this is a, a quick little snippet of um, talking about Anthony Bourdain. Um, Accusing the world of robbing Palestinians of their basic humanity, and oh, this you know when I saw the headline for this, uh, pulling up uh, research uh, on Anthony Bourdain, I was just like, oh man. The more I learn about him, the more I love him, dude. The more I love this guy. Today's segment um, with the words of the celebrity chef and television presenter Anthony Bourdain. We just learned today he's died by suicide in Strasbourg, France, as he was filming one of his episodes of his very popular show, Parts Unknown. He traveled to Gaza. In 2014, he won an award from the Muslim Public Affairs Council. This was his speech. I was enormously grateful for the response from Palestinians in particular, for doing what seemed to me an ordinary thing. Something we do all the time, show regular people doing everyday things. The world has visited many terrible things on the Palestinian people, none more shameful than robbing them of their basic humanity. People are not statistics. That is all we attempted to show. Matt, those are the words of Anthony Bourdain. Again, died by suicide this morning in Strasbourg, France, as he was filming one of his episodes for Parts Unknown for CNN. Damn. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, like, I mean, just delving on to that point about, you know, what's been going on with, um, oh my God, a comment posted up, or posted, he was murdered. Not one celebrity had the balls to stand up for Palestine, and he didn't say anything rude to the Jewish community by in doing so. Suicide my ass. Oh, shut the fuck up. And I can't believe 127 people liked your dumbass comment, bro. Oh, my... Mossad? Mossad? Who the fuck is Mossad? Oh, my god. I don't give a fuck. Fuck your ass. Fuck your dumb ass. <sighs> what? Any? Whatever. I don't care. Anyway, I mean, it, I mean, it's true that you don't hear s major celebrities or any or um, you know any notable figures ever call out what's been going on to the Palestinians. I mean, with the last major protests that have been happening, I've been, oh, up to what two thousand people were wounded and up to sixty people were killed, including infants and children and in the past israel has killed six journalists and not a single israel israeli has been hurt killed or injured but yet oh the fucking palestinians are such a major threat so let's revoke their human rights you know it's it's nice that you know there's actually somebody here who actually has some common sense who are who's able to understand that what we're doing in palestine and what's going on in gaza is atrocious and a crime against humanity it is you know man i'm loving this guy dude F fuck your death man why why'd you die dude why why'd you do it you know i think at the very end of this i'll kind of get into my uh my what i think why he might have killed himself i, I i'm not gonna get into like um 
like into uh, weird conspiracies. I'm just going into like my personal opinion, like what might have gone through his head. Like that's all, you know, because I, I, I'm pretty sure like who, what, what achievements and what outcomes comes out of killing him? Really, like seriously, what does anyone from Weinstein or Mossad, I guess, whoever that guy is, I don't, I don't know who they were talking about, like, or just anyone, how, what good comes out of just offing him? Seriously, what, what, because I don't see, I don't see anything so far. He, sure, he obviously has kind of grinded against the status quo of the establishment, uh, especially in the celebrity world, in a lot of senses, sure. But it's not seriously worth just killing him over, because I really don't think that would have ever been the case. But I, I just don't see it. I, I really don't. But anyway, um, almost actually done here. This is actually kind of a short ignorism, just because it's mainly just kind of going over Anthony Bourdain as a whole. Like, because as you can tell, I could have gone into so many different things about him. And, you know, maybe I will. Maybe I will at some point. Just go into specific detail about, like, uh, the things he was doing and, um, and just dive really deep into it. So hopefully maybe this will at least kind of give you a gateways to check out, like, from his uh, interest in food and cuisine to, you know, his opinions in the world and his worldview from traveling to... It's everything. So, anyway, uh, this is another video called The Untold Truths of uh, Anthony Bourdain. And there's there's a couple here. Um, um, so one says, recovering addict, rebellious taste, pain is dues, a faithful trip, serious about jujitsu, late bloomer, unlikely advocate, and many fences. So I guess we'll just kind of go into every single one of these little points and uh, just get into it. Recovering addict. It's no secret that substance abuse runs rampant in the food service industry. Oh, yeah, that's so true. <laughs> that's true, dude. I mean, there's always like a... I've at least always noticed that it's just kind of a common stereotype that chefs are drug addicts and shit. And it's like... I mean, not all the time, but... Hey, you know, who isn't... You know, who isn't prone to being a drug addict? Honestly. Like, it's a stereotype that Wall Street bankers are pumped up on cocaine all the time. It's a stereotype that black people love uh, meth and coke, I guess. I, mean, I don't really know. I, I mean, I'm, I, I hear that a lot, at least up here. Um, it's a pretty common stereotype that the Russians, at least here too, are into heroin and meth. It's like, it's like, there's everyone has stereotypes about drugs. So this doesn't surprise me that the restaurant industry has stereotypes of their own about drugs. I mean, we just went into a lot of his drugs that were going on to his restaurants at the Chobo thing on on uh, his wiki. So, yeah, <laughs> we don't. I, there's, I don't need to try to counter that. There's, there's, it would just be just so stupid to try. Gordon developed a serious problem with drugs while working in kitchens many years ago. Most significantly, he developed a heroin addiction, which he managed to kick in the eighties. I wanted to become a heroin addict. I was very proud of myself when I first shot up. I was a vulnerable, goofy, awkward guy whose only success socially was to be the baddest guy in the room. He also smoked crack cocaine. On a Reddit AMA, he wrote that he found himself combing the shag carpet for paint chips in the hope that they were falling crack bits, and smoking them anyway. He quit that too. But unlike many addicts who give up any and all substances when they get clean, Gordon still drinks alcohol. He knows he's unusual and writes, most people who kick heroin and cocaine have to give up on everything. Maybe because my experiences were so awful in the end, I've never been tempted to relapse. But you'll never find... Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, which kind of shows that for him at least, he's able to understand the moderation and is able to kind of overcome that will of, you know, hey, I, I know my brain's definitely a little tweaked permanently due to these uh, past addictions, but, you know, I'm able to find, you know joy and at least like release in these other substances that I know won't be as harmful within my own moderational limits that aren't as addictive and bad so it's really cool that he was you know going into about him being a re uh, recovering addict and going into a lot of this um, stuff is pretty interesting pretty cool though anyway 
Almost Four day knocking one back at home. He told Mad's Journal, I don't ever drink in my house. When I indulge, I indulge. But I don't let it bleed over into the rest of my life. Yeah. I mean, that's how it should just be. You know, if you want to indulge yourself, go right for it, man. Indulge yourself into a little something-something. But don't let it bleed over, like he said, don't let it bleed over into the rest of your life and don't let it take over your life, you know what I mean? Like, it shouldn't, you shouldn't, if it gets, if you notice it gets to that point, maybe you should re rethink about it and probably at least think of, you know, some form of aid to help you along with reversing that effect. So, <clears throat> it's pretty cool. Rebellious taste. Bourdain came from relatively humble origins in New Jersey, where he was raised on standard American cuisine. But he was intrigued by the smells that would drift upstairs when the adults were hosting dinner parties downstairs. And when his family traveled abroad, his curiosity only grew. He told The Guardian that he responded to being left out of adult dinners by his parents with a culinary huh. rebellion of sorts, recalling, I reacted by requesting oysters and dishes they found repulsive and becoming increasingly adventurous in my taste. It huh. wasn't about the food, but about getting a reaction. And he huh. So in a way, he kind of likes having a, uh, not, like, kind of a more controversial opinion on him, uh, not on himself, but just, like, an, a con more like a, whoa, you know, because he did something that would be kind of repulsive or kind of controversial to other people. So I think it seems like this has kind of always been his, uh, memo, um, when it came to, uh, his life, um, especially with his shows and how he feels about the world view, it seems like that really, really developed with a strong connection with food and um, he's somewhat rebellious and kind of like, hey, you guys don't like that food, can I have that? I mean, he's a really interesting guy, man. He really is a very peculiar man. Hasn't stopped, but for a man who's traveled the world eating everything, he told Conan that even he has limits. I, I've eaten a lot of really nasty things on my show, but nothing is soul destroying as my airport Johnny Rockets experience. Thank you, Zeus. How did I get from, you know, dunking breaded clams and hot grease to where I am today? If I know. <laughs> I love that. Fuck if I know. Damn. <laughs> I love that quote his teeth in the restaurant business as a dishwasher, and he actually liked the job. At the time, he was a self-professed awkward teenager, and as he told The Guardian, this job made total objective sense to him. The ability to perform the job well, accomplishing any task given to him within the job description, allowed him to flourish under the tutelage of people he respected and admired. Wow. He told Fresh Air, I was a happy dishwasher. I jokingly say that I learned every important lesson, uh, uh, all the most important lessons of my life as a dishwasher. Wow. I mean... Technically, that's kind of what I do at my own work, but I'm not, like, strictly just stuck with that, you know what I mean? But, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, just being in that, you know, kind of, bot not maybe the bottom of the barrel, but, you know, you're, you're down there. I mean, kind of being down there definitely, you know, brings more of a, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, brings more of a... Uh, more of like a sense of reality check to kind of help you with your own worldview, if that makes sense. A fateful trip. Bourdain did do a bit of traveling before he became a famous globetrotting chef. So what was it that made him want to do more in life and see more of the world? The first time I came here, it was just like taking acid for the first time. Bourdain told Men's Journal... <laughs> yeah, and you know how that felt like. A trip to Japan, shortly before Kitchen Confidential was published, completely changed his life. He said, It showed me there was so much more in the world than I had any idea about. There was so much to learn, and there was so much stuff out there. Serious about jujitsu. Huh. If you watch Parts Unknown, you're privy to the fact that Bourdain is in good shape. Apparently, they don't know what tapping out means here, because I was tapping like Western You'll even catch him in action as a serious practitioner of the martial arts, specifically Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. That's pretty cool. Don't really need to get too much into that, because, I mean, not too much to talk about that, but that's pretty cool. I mean, it seems like he always wanted to try to make sure he stayed active, especially being a world traveler. I mean, you got to stay active in order to go to all these places and be traveling as much as you are. Well, let's just skip right into the late bloomer part. See what this it's is about. It's hard to look at Bourdain and imagine him struggling to pay his bills, but he spent years busting his hump in the kitchen, worrying if he'd be able to get by. He told Biography that at age 44, he was 
standing in kitchens, not knowing what it was like to go to sleep without being in mortal terror. I was in horrible, endless, irrevocable debt. I had no health insurance, I didn't pay my taxes, I couldn't pay my rent. Wow. But things changed for Bourdain when his first book, Kitchen Confidential, was published. Catapulting him out of the world of kitchen obscurity and into the world of celebrity. The book, which was credited with revolutionizing the entire genre of food writing, was so well received that he no longer had to slave in a kitchen for 12 or more hours every day. He told Fresh Air, when the book came out, it very quickly uh, transformed my life. I mean, it changed everything. Wow. Assume like um, the book, uh, his book was essentially like, hey, you know, this is either going to make or break me on that. Like either this book will be a success and I'm able to maybe do something with more of myself or I'm just going to be stuck here just doing the same you know, lame thing, you know, all the time, just doing what I'm doing. I mean, for him, it obviously wasn't lame, but, I mean, it's, you know, compared to what he's done, um, to then, yeah, I mean, what he was originally doing is, you know, lame. But, overall, I mean, he, yeah, I mean, he seemed like he always tried to stay happy and positive uh, most of the life, so I, I really... You know, it does confuse me why he did kill himself, but in a way, I can maybe see it. But, again, you know, it's just so soon that we might not be able to really kind of totally get into why he might have done that, you know? But at least I can probably make an assumption and, and a hypothesis as to why, maybe. Unlikely advocate. As a rule, Bourdain says he isn't prone to advocacy, but when it comes to food waste, he's throwing his full weight into raising awareness about it. In the United States, 40% of the food they produce is going to waste. That alarming statistic was the impetus that inspired Bourdain to join the team behind the documentary Wasted as an executive producer. As a young cook, I came up in an old school system, use everything, waste nothing. But it's not the only trending topic. Yeah, I kind of have the similar opinion, and working in a, uh, a similar food industry, not just strictly food, but I mean, you know what I mean, like uh, just specifically into working with food all the time, you know, uh, yeah, it's, the amount of food waste that we have is, oh my god, it, I'm like kind of desensitized to it at this point, but fuck man, you, every time I do it, you know, there's... Every time I thought it back in my mind, it's like, you know, despite it not looking as great as it, you know, could be or whatever, this late at night, there are people who are still willing enough and hungry enough to try it and eat it and have it, you know, because they need something. And it's, it fucking make, disgusts me that we have to do that, you know. And, you know, I just wish that the f this food waste problem that we do have in America wasn't so prevalent as it is because we could help feed the world. I mean, we could help um, make sure that people don't have to be starving and malnutri uh, malnutritioned. I mean, because like you said, like they said, uh, we waste uh, forty percent of the food that we make. We don't. That why is that a thing? It's because you know, of course, you know, you have to distress certain foods because you can't save it or whatever because it's perishable or some shit. And then not only that, you get, uh, when you uh, do harvesting season amongst your agricultural foods, anything that's considered like genetically deformed or physically deformed or whatever is just considered a toss away. And even though it's still just as good as the rest, you know? So, I mean, or if it's not a certain size or doesn't look a certain way, they throw it away. It's like, why does that have to be the case? It's still just as good as the other fruits. Just because it's a little weird don't mean it's deadly. Don't mean it's, you know, meant to just be thrown away. It's meant to be consumed. Eat it. You're meant to eat it, so let's give it to people who need it. So how much was meant Whoa. to solve world hunger? Whoa, what? Whoa. So wait, how much could solve world hunger? It's, I, I didn't get into the financials of it. I didn't expect uh, you to show up. Yeah, I had nothing to do. I was gonna, yeah, I was uh, gonna go to bed after this uh, ignorism I'm doing on right now. Oh. Talking about uh, Anthony Bourdain. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, I was just talking about like his um, some of his uh, advocacy things that is going into because I've already went into a lot, oh, all sorts of different shit. Yeah, I popped oh, I up. What would be the estimated time that you'd be finished? Fuck if I know, to be honest. I mean, I just do these until I just, like, covered everything I possibly could think of.
Could I charge my phone and perhaps send some input? You might as well. I mean, you're here now. Uh, I think the door should just be unlocked. Oh, hell, hell yeah. All right. Hey, guys. <laughs> a random a random guest. You could see him, like, hold up, right yeah, there. I think some of them already knew that I was back there. They probably just didn't say anything. Well, there's no one technically watching. Stefan was watching earlier, and there was a couple of people popping in and out, which, you know, it's whatever. Well, yeah, you know, you got to gain traction somehow, you know. Yeah, You yeah. can't just uh, look for immediate satisfaction. And yeah, expect, I mean, you know, yeah, there's, the yeah, table. I mean, I can also give you the rundown of a lot of what I've been talking about. Because I, despite, like, going over so much shit right now, I mean, it's not too much that you've really actually missed. It's just going into a lot of detail and depth about a lot of his life and stuff, which is really is that, interesting. Is that Neil deGrasse Tyson? This is Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about Anthony Bourdain. Yeah, Whoa. and what he had to say was really interesting too. And I actually was able to delve into something else because he mentioned that he was on Star Talk with him, and that got me to delve into something else. And then you know, so it's a it's a freaking rabbit hole how oh, that wow. goes down. Yeah. But yeah. I'm yeah. Go. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Come right around door. I actually did not expect that, but I don't care. Whatever. This is not the first time my ignorisms have been invaded. By the public space. My name's J.F. Kalepi. We have the public space. Might as well move my camera now a little bit. So, when he sits down, there will at least be somebody there. See, that phone call I had at the beginning stream was my boa TK. And damn it, did I, I knew it. <laughs> I had a feeling it was going to come by at 1.40 in the morning. <laughs> Whatever. I don't care. I don't give a fuck. Shit happens. I'm not doing anything that much tomorrow besides working later half the day anyway, so it's like, who gives a fuck? Just gonna shake that fat. Fat. Damn straight, yeah. With my wallet. With that, too. Yeah, so, yeah, just a basic rundown was I was just kind of going over his, uh, just yeah. the quick facts of his death. I mean, because he died, uh, he was confirmed dead on yet today, technically, but I mean, it's the 9th now, but he was uh, confirmed dead on June 8th. I mean, it's pretty young for these days, too. He died at 61, so yeah. he's, he wasn't old, but I mean, he was up there. He was up there in age. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... Like, that surprises me, isn't it? Yeah, I went into a little bit of his uh, shows here, um... Um, that he uh, went into the Cook's a Cook's tour, no reservations to label over and parts unknown. So he he was a culinary artist then. Yeah, and uh, he also was a, a travel documentarian. And um, in his later life, uh, he was also author. But in his later life, he uh, kind of started using it as uh, kind of a way to get more political. Because in parts unknown. Uh, it was done on CNN, which was uh, focusing on cuisines, cultures, and politics, which premiered on April 14th. And That's he had an interesting combination. I, honestly, I, I totally to... see it, though. I totally <laughs> see it, because what brings people together better than food? Can you name something better than food? Because I really... Culture, politics, language, yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, that's how a lot of people started trading and shit, was with food. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean... So that actually makes perfect Yeah, sense. in a way, he kind of delved into... I mean, he had a major appreciation for, quote, peasants' food or street food and um, specific cultural foods. Like, he had a really um, deep, like, uh, appreciation for that. And he um, was also very... He also had um, understood the value and... Um, the value and the worth and recognition of like Hispanic cooks specifically, especially immigrants, oh, yeah. uh, because of their ability to just like be really great chefs, regardless of uh, cultural cuisine. I mean, he, uh, I guess, like they're frugal too. Well, uh, not really just that, but I mean, just their. I mean, here, yeah, here's the interest in adequacy. So he championed industri industrious Spanish-speaking immigrants from Mexico, Ecuador, etc., who who are cooks and chefs mainly in U.S. restaurants, including upscale restaurants, regardless of cuisine. He considered them talented chefs and invaluable cooks, underpaid and unrecognized, even though they have become the backbone of the U.S. food industry. That's what he uh, said about it. And overall, yeah, I totally agree with it because I mean, when you look at these bigger chains of like restaurants and stuff i mean just in general i mean a lot of chefs and just uh people who work in that industry do get unrecognized and underpaid 
Well, that's so true. Actually, it's funny. Um, you know, thoughty too, right? That Welsh dude. Faulty with the, thoughty too. With the Cockney accent. Thoughty too. Thoughty too here. He says, "Sounds like the same forty. I, I've actually played a couple of his videos before here. Because uh, he has um, cool shit to show too. He actually made a comment about that too. Like he had an entire video, like you know how like tipping is bullshit. It is. Oh my really god! Do you realize how much tip? Like. It's an excuse for um, restaurants and like bars and shit. Their yeah, waitresses. to underpay, you know. And their um, too. Yeah, um, Rip City's younger brother uh, equals. Uh, he has to suffer for that shit oh because he remember when he was working at McGrath's. He had to suffer uh, for all yeah. that shit. Yeah, he was like saying, "It's like yeah, I made a lot of good tips. So I'm gonna have a good a good bank right now." It's like you don't have to do that via tips, you know, because tips is bullshit, right? It is. Yeah. Of course, like another thing is. Um... Uh, what, what did it stand for? I think it was to ensure posterity. That's what um, tipping, like that's the acronym. It's actually an acronym. It's an acronym? Yeah. So I think in uh, in England and various other parts of Europe, what they did is, you know, like in, in um, pubs, they would in, they'd kind of like encourage better service mm -hmm. for some of the bartenders. Yeah. By like, you know, putting money in a jar, you know, in addition to um, what they were paying for. And drinks, and yeah. that's where it actually came from. And so, like the American uh, wealthy people gave that an idea, like, yeah, let's just give it to, you know to some of the beggars on the street. And uh, in fact, actually, uh, the idea, you know, like the most uh, yeah. earliest modern idea and execution of um, tipping was in like train restaurants. You know, they would hire newly emancipated slaves. You know. Oh, and people. underpay them. Yeah, and underpay them so then they can live off the tips. Yeah, because so it's also, actually a racist. It's <laughs> yeah that see and when people say oh you know you're just putting race in issues it's like no that we're not when that's it comes actually, to tips that's actually historically accurate. Yeah, right? you know you're actually just being correct. It's you're not, not being politically correct in this. Not not anymore. It's just over. It's, it's more classist oh. if anything. It's classist at this point, true. but. Uh, at the time, oh, very much so. It was very it was systemic racism because yeah. of segregation. I mean, That's we, when it actually, you know, yeah. existed. Yeah, and it uh, still goes on today with, you know, systemic racism. It's just a lot more subtle and a lot more... Oh, yeah. Infrequent. It's, it's infrequent. Yeah, it's in, like, yeah, that's what I mean. Inf justice it's infrequent. Um, it's not as prevalent as it used to be, but it, it still is a problem, for sure. So but like, yeah, yeah. I mean, because look at the police brutality. I mean, there's been so much specific discrimination against uh, black peoples, especially with. Yeah, I mean, it people could also be the cops themselves too. Well, that's what I mean. Like, I mean, these cops who are able to. I mean, we're getting on a major tangent from Anthony Bourdain to yeah. fucking cops now all of a sudden. But I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how to charge his phone and mine at the same time here. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay. It's, it's actually working pretty well. Too. Well, I'm just going to put it right here. That work. Oh, fuck. Well, yeah, we'll put it over here. But anyway, yeah, I mean, like, because there's been so much specific, you know, you know, cops basically just abusing their powers against minorities, especially oh, yeah. specific uh, police um, bureaus around, police departments all over the country. Well, you know, it's sometimes mainly... I get, like, you know, stopped by police just because of my long hair. I've never really, I've never had police ever stop me besides a couple times when I'm riding my bike or whatever. But I mean, I've never really have been stopped it's, myself. It's almost always in Milwaukee, and it's well, because like they'll quickly learn that I'm you know not guilty of a crime, but I'll look like someone who did, and it's usually a vandalism or like you know. Oh, some just kind so of you robbery. look like you, so you look like a yeah. supposed um wit someone that witnessed it, and then you. <laughs> I like mean, this one cop described like a guy wearing a black coat, kind of heavy set, and he's like, uh, "You kind of look like him. Um, like, can I see your hands?" He 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 was known for like breaking, you know, a window with his bare hands, and I'm like, "Clean, to like in this case, I'm not caught red-handed." Ah, did you actually pull that pun? I should have. I squandered it's that moment. Oh that damn, like, dude. That would have been funny. Yeah. Anyway, um. This looks like the other parts of his advocacy here, which is considering how Harvey fuckfaces um on the screen right now, 
I'm his, it, this sounds like it's about to go into uh, some of the uh, his advocacy against sexual harassment in restaurants in Hollywood because I I did go briefly into that. Yeah, Hollywood is just a cesspool of sexual perversion, man. It I mean, is it's run by pedophiles, rapists, some sexual harassers, obviously. Like to say witches, but I mean, there's no. Don't I, that. Oh my god! Oh my god! My there's dad a, you, made the funniest thing. It's like you know what witches make their wands out of Hollywood. I'm like. There's what? no proof of witches. And also, yeah, why, Holly... If, if they there's were a, so proficient in magic, why would they need a wand to wield it? <laughs> like, and it's... <laughs> I'm just taken aback by that. Like, what? I, I really don't even have anything to say, because Hollywood is a type of Hollywood wood. Is... It's a literal piece of wood, yeah, because Holly is a tree, Holly trees. But it... It wasn't. It, it literally wasn't even founded on anything liberal and shit. Like Hollywood, when it yeah. first was settled, was founded on Christian conservative values mostly. Because Ironically, yeah, so I mean, you can't make that point. It, 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 like, you literally can't make that point. I know it's it's it's, it's stupid. stupid. Yeah. You know what? I've kind of um. So I had this thesis like kind of just brewing in my mind lately, and I want to know if people find this eloquent or not. I'm kind of starting to think that, like, Christianity is SJW trash. It's just it, it, like, not... It actually it's, has SJW sentiments in it. I, like, there's a part do of the Do SJWs Bible. know that, the, know that though, about that, about the Bible? I Because I, I really doubt it. I mean... No, they don't. And that's the funny thing. Well, then again, they don't, they don't uh, get half of the shit they're going into anyway. Well, yeah, but, like... Yeah. If there's one thing, um, like... There's actually a part in the Bible, I mean, I haven't cited it, so you can either trust me or not trust me, because this is face value. I'll have to look into it later, maybe next stream. I have, like, 50 Bibles in this house. You want me to just grab you one? Because, like, <laughs> sure, I mean, like, there's one uh, passage, I don't know what book it's actually from, but it's like, it's better to um, put something horrible in your mouth than something horrible that comes out of it. That sounds like an SJW sentiment. The like, you know, don't fear <laughs> triggering someone or to trigger God. Really, a powerful being that's all omnipotent, and, and he's besides, worried about getting offended by okay, what you say. Okay. Oh, by the way, if he's omnipotent, does it, or om, omniscient, whatever. Uh, if he's like omniscient, uh, omnipot, uh, omnipotent, uh, omnipotent. Why am I fucking on that word? Um, if he, I've only had one hit too on this whole stream, and since I got off work, actually, yeah. so I'm not as stoned as I normally would be. But okay. anyway, yeah. Like, if he really was, he would have already known you thought about that thought. Yeah. So he would have been offended at the idea that you thought the thought in the first place. So why does it matter if you say it or not? I mean, but if he's omniscient, omnipotent, and um, has control over everything and knows everything, then he already knew you were going to make that thought anyway. So do you even have the three will, free will to make that thought? Yeah, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, religion overall is definitely bullshit. And also, it's sure. really funny because, like, Jesus was also <laughs> the perfect um, left-wing straw man. So that's super ironic and also very hypocritical. Here yeah. are these conservative Christian people that worship Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was a communist. He said, "It's you have the greater chance of putting a camel through the eye of a needle than a rich person in heaven. Who hates rich people? Commies. Great rich people. Like me, but I'm not a commie. Like, what? A actually, um, I Anthony mean, also, Bourd There's actually a, like, I, w I was in a church camp. Yeah, I know. I've been at them too. But like, You're not they alone. were talking about um, a rich man named Zacchaeus. You know, and like, Jesus was there like, dude, you should give all the things you don't need to the poor people who are starving and downtrodden, man. And then Zacchaeus is like, hey, what else am I doing wrong, you know? I mean, I'm not having sex before marriage. I'm not. See, I'm fasting. Pork. I'm fasting before the Lord. Look I'm, at me in my. I'm fasting. You know, I'm not wearing more than one fabric. Look you at me on my one rope fabric. I'm Gucci, man. Aren't I Gucci? They're like, no, you you ain't Gucci enough, bro. You gotta give all the stuff you don't need and yeah. not be as rich, man. Yeah, and um, Bourdain also said that he was... To build a commune, man, and, yeah. and take a uh, hit, take, smoke <laughs> some indica and smoke the pipe of peace. Because Jesus yeah. was a fucking hippie, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it, also, Bourdain said that he was raised without religion because um, 
His uh, uh, father was a uh, Catholic and his uh, mother was Jewish. So it seems like even they were more like culturally, secular. more yeah, secular and culturally um, religious instead of actually like fundamentally religious and stuff like oh, that. Yeah, that's better. Like you know, just yeah, keep the religious you know beliefs to yourself. I've always said that, yeah. I mean, I did an ignorism on Richard Dawkins, which I kind of, which is more, I guess, specifically on religion, because I, uh, which, I mean, if there's a god out there, he's not totally fully omnipotent. Yeah. If anything, he's like he's either the engineer or he created you without the agency, because he's an organism that just can't help but create things. Yeah. Anyway, um, I gotta, I'm gonna uh, play this really quick, cause uh, La Mama. I guess because the dogs woke woke her the fuck up, uh, she needed me to see really quick. But I'll let this continue to play here on the advocacy. And if you want, you can uh, put your uh, comment on this too, because there's like one more little thing after this on uh, mending fences, which is like, the last little part I was gonna get into about. before I continued on. Oh, uh, oh, what the fuck! I somehow got out of that. Gotta go back. Here we go. There we go. All right. I know it's fun. Is among the many women who have said they were assaulted by Harvey Weinstein, and Bourdain says that has brought the issue home for him. He told Slate he's doing some soul searching, asking himself, "Why was I not the sort of person people would see as a natural ally here?" I started looking at that. Mending fences. That's pretty good. There are a few choice things Bourdain is known for, and feuding with other celebrity uh, chefs is one of them. He's thrown down on everyone from Bobby Flay to Rachel Ray, leveling his peers with colorful and profane barbs. But in recent years, it seems that Bourdain may be spending less time trash-talking and more time focusing on his work. Some of his more recent insults toward Guy Fieri are tamer than those in the past, and he's been mum about Paula Dean for some years now, which is a huge change in tact from his previous critiques of her. This is not Southern Schmidt she's been so this oh is my God. Brand has been for all those he years. He sounds intriguing. Novelty. It's too bad that he's burgers died between, you know, Krispy Kreme donuts. Before I could really know about it, that's sad. The headline that came and took out with Emeril Lagasse in January of 2017. But hey, if he had a following, perhaps, 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 sucks for the most part but you know maybe he just got a sponsorship from cnn or something like that you know anything that any like mainstream media outlet you know shows i always take with a grain of salt i'm also just trying to keep uh you know airtime interesting so if you guys have any questions if any of you are even out there i don't even know um hope i'm not meandering too much but yeah i mean damn so I guess he called out many of, you know, one of Harvey Weinstein's, or I guess like, or at least gave out more, you know, further evidence or more proof. I mean, I just entered this so I know yeah. monumentally less than he does. Yeah, I mean, there's also, I could give you a funny, stupid, retarded conspiracy about his death already. <laughs> oh my god. Some people think that Harvey Weinstein had a play of his, quote, murder, um, because his uh, partner at the, uh, at the at this time, well, not anymore because he's dead. But um, who uh, was an, uh, someone accusing Harvey Weinstein of sexual harassment himself? And it's just like, what? I mean, wh who has any benefit of killing him? You know, like Harvey Weinstein doesn't, and Quentin Tarantino uh, doesn't because apparently he said he was complicit in the sex scandal as well. I mean, like. If he were to kill, it, like, if he planned to kill Anthony Bourdain, you know, mm -hmm. I think what would have happened was he would have done it before Anthony Bourdain even spoke about it. Yeah. That would have been the more likely, you know, like, situation. But, I mean, at that point, he already spoke out, so there's nothing that he could do. So, yes, he especially wouldn't gain anything from that. Yeah. If he did it before he spoke out, that would have made more sense. And then the information came out later. Right. You know, it's, that would it really doesn't sense. make sense. I mean, any of the conspiracies I've heard, which has been like three, and they're all are very vague and stupid. And also, like, a lot of rich oligarchs, they're too cowardly to actually go out and single-handedly kill someone. Or have revenge. a play in it. Well, I mean, or they... don't have any involvement in it. Yeah, well, I mean, some do, but, or I mean, if they over, do, over Anthony, you know, though, definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I pulled up something of some of his uh, 
16 quotes. And on Head Out Blog, this is 16 of our favorite quotes. <laughs> which, there, I mean, I might as well check out some quotes because I saw some of them. They're really, really interesting. So the first one is, your body is not a temple. It's an amusement park. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> I like that because, I mean, it, or, yeah, it's not a temple. It's an amusement Yeah, I mean, in a way, I mean, I, I, I like it. I'm kind of 50 50 because I think, you know, you should definitely treat your body well, kind of like a temple. But, you know, it, it's in a way, it's also an amusement park. That's so you I should enjoy the ride. Learn. You should definitely <laughs> enjoy the ride, though, for sure. Well, I mean, that could also be interpreted in so many different ways. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I mean, like, hey, you could enjoy other amusement parks, right? He was a very big drug uh, addict in the food industry, though. Oh, man. Hey, you want to get into that really quick? He, uh. Um, well, nobody's perfect. Former user of cocaine, heroin, and LSD, he oh. um, he uh, quoted in a, a 1981 um, or wrote of his experience in Kitchen Confidential. We were high all the time, sneaking off in the walk-in refrigerator at every opportunity to conceptualize. Hardly a decision was made without drugs, cannabis, methoquodone, uh, cocaine, LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, soaked oh. in honey, and used to uh, to sweeten tea. Sector Bartol, Turinol, Amphibanine, which is like ADHD meds, and Codeine, and increasingly Heroin, which was us, which he'd, we'd send a Spanish-speaking busboy over to Alphabet City to get. And um, he also had, uh, so Methoquodone is also known as Quaaludes, so he, he was doing oh, Quaaludes. Oh, fuck. Yeah, cocaine, Quaaludes. He did quail, all that shit. Ca- marijuana, that. The, no meth as far okay, as I could tell. Just cocaine, heroin, LSD, marijuana, Quaaludes, psilocybin mushrooms, um, secobarotol, which I actually really don't know what it is, but it's a hypno- has hypnotic properties, anticonvulsant, uh, anxiolytic, oh sedati- uh, sedative, and anesthetic. So fucks you up, it sounds like. And yeah, some hypnotic. of these I just don't. Oh some God. of these I just don't really understand. Uh, don't know some of this, but it's just like holy fuck, bro. <laughs> it's like damn. The psilocybin yeah. mushrooms, holy shit. Yeah, uh, Bourdain has also been known for unrepentant drinker and smoker, though he uh, quit smoking in 2006 for the sake of his daughter. And um, he's still and um, and not a Bourdain's at the time. Uh, he's uh, um, apparently used to like be like a two pack a day cigarette habit. Whoa! Damn. Yeah, sounds crazy though. Kind of weird how the screen's black and white. Is that the way it's oh. streaming? Yeah, when it comes to ignorisms, I do it specifically in like sap- uh, sapia. It's not black and white, oh, it's just okay. in sapia. I, there's not a good black and white option, so I just do this. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it's more of a more, more solemn and professional background, talking into yeah. philosophy of people. Only this one's a little bit more different, as in we're just kind of getting into a specific character of a man. Anyway, yeah, going back uh, to the quotes real died, quick. died, we're just kind of immortalizing his legacy. Anyway, I hope it's yeah. not like we're milking views. I'm not. Like, oh, a celebrity just died. Hey, let's kiss his ass. You know, like, I don't know. I, you know the mainstream media does that all the time. It's like when some dude, event happens. CNN like, circle has jerk, circle CNN jerk, circle jerk, circle jerk. Ha- circle jerk. CNN has honestly milked the fuck out of this. I mean, this circle is Circle Jerk News the, Network. Yeah, basically the CJNN. <laughs> yep. So this is the only one I kind of picked out of CNN because they have one oh, with Anderson, Anderson, Coop, Anderson Glanderson Cooper. Glanderson Booper. There's Glanderson Booper. Glanderson Booper. Glenn Beck and Anderson Cooper had a baby. Glanderson oh, Booper. Oh. And they have a CNN anchor brought to tears honoring him. You know, uh, Chris Cuomo. Uh, oh, no, never mind. That's something different. Not related. Um, oh, did you know that Alex right. Jones harassed uh, Bernie Sanders at LAX? I saw that on the, uh, the you know one of the YouTube videos, but I did I didn't have the time to actually click on it. Honestly, I'm it, interested. I'll, I'll have to show you after this because it's hilarious. Okay. So here's another quote by uh, Berdeen. Travel. Bernie, did, did Bernie Sanders at least uh, like gave him a really hilarious comeback, or did he like? When he first, when he first, uh, when he first uh, showed up, he said, "Who is this?" and walked off and just kind of ignored him while his. Uh, Aid uh, was dealing with him, and honestly, it's 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 hilarious. You gotta so watch it. It's, it's like awkward some... as fuck, bro. And a random oh, yeah. dude at the airport actually kind of shut him down. It was hilarious. That's funny. I mean, like Alex Jones is 
He's such an autist, man. Uh, he's he, he's like an irrational he's, autist. He, he's thing. spurgier than the hardest spurgs out there, dude. Like, I'm an autist. I'm saying, like, I'm a literal high-functioning autistic person. I think and we I'm both are. I'm saying this. He's, Alex Jones has to be autistic, man. It would only or, make sense. Or fucked up on steroids or some shit, which is definitely... Actually, that sounds per. You know who else I think has roid rage? Fucking Vegan Gains, man. That faggot. Vegan Gains? <laughs> yeah. That name is just fucking... Oh, God. Oh, my it's God. It's almost an oxymoron, man. Vegan Gains. <laughs> but, dude, like, that guy's YouTube channel, oh, my God. Like, seriously, he, like... He explodes with total rage on almost every single other. I video I've he only has. heard of him. I think I've for I think I'm fortunate that I haven't seen these. No, it's so funny. It's, oh my, it's well, so hilarious. We got a lot of shit to check out after the stream. He's it's so obvious. He does anabolic steroids, man. I mean, look this guy up. It, like, I will. You don't think he uses anabolic steroids? And he, like, look at his channel and then come back to me with a straight face and say that he doesn't use anabolic steroids. Oh my god. If he Says no. It's obvious he's lying, which he always fucking lies. Oh, I bet. Anyway, here's another quote. Uh, Travel changes you. As you move through this life and this world, you change things slightly. You leave marks behind, however small. In, a re in a return, life and travel leaves marks on you. Most, most of the time, those marks on your body or on your heart are beautiful. Often, though, they hurt. Damn, that's a pretty... Uh, that's pretty profound. Yeah, that's a pretty, very profound uh, quote. Because, I mean, it just kind of goes back into the first quote, actually. You know, it's in, you know, your body is an amusement park. Enjoy the ride. Because, I mean, there's going to be, you know, marks on you that are going to be beautiful and uh, great. But, you know, often, sometimes it'll hurt. Because, I mean, you might get like, fade away. Maybe you might get upset, you know. Just drama in your life or just some shit happens, you know. I mean, here's another one. A few things are more beautiful to me than a bunch of thuggish, heavy tattooed line cooks moving around each other like ballerinas in a bitty Z Saturday night. <laughs> That's a funny uh, way to uh, get that imagery. Seeing two guys who who just as soon cut each other's throats in their off hours moving in unison with grace and ease can be as uplifting as any chemical stimulant or organized religion. Damn. I mean, yeah, when you see, like, a bunch of chefs in the back and they all look like, you know, they're just, like, in a gang or some shit, I mean, it, you know, in a way, you do really kind of see... You know, when it comes to restaurants, those are the most un underappreciated people. They are. In the restaurant business. The chefs, man. Because, mm -hmm. like, they're the ones actually cooking the food. They're, they're the, the ones with the talent. Why you're fucking here. Why you're fucking there. Yeah. Not the fucking pretty waitresses or the big titties and the blonde hair, you know. Like, are, you, are you just taking a shot at Hooters? Are you just I did you just take a shot at Hooters? Actually no. But you might as well you might as well did. You, Cause like, <laughs> Hooters actually I've never even eaten there. Me neither. There there used to be uh, Hooters nearby. I think by Bob's Red Mill, but then it like closed down or something. <laughs> Honestly I, you is know, that the only thing that people come for, oh, PG thirteen cleavage. Like, who the fuck cares, man? Honest, yeah. I mean, honestly, I just want to go there just maybe for the experience, but that'll probably be about it. You but know like, what I mean? Is the food even decent? That's like, what it, I'm wondering. I want to go there, there for the experience to find out if the food's good. And if it's actually good, then at least they're backing up their beautiful women with who are more than likely thoughts unfortunately but hey they're if beautiful I'm as fuck going, you know to a restaurant i want there to be good food if it's not good food i'm not gonna fucking eat there well i mean evidently hooters is doing something right though if the i mean if people are coming back besides just the women i mean if if you have the most shittiest food and the most hottest of babes it doesn't matter how hot those babes are if your food is trash you're not gonna go back yeah I mean, it's like Heart Attack Grill. I mean, their food is good as fuck. They got s basically stripper nurses serving you. <laughs> and if you're fat as fuck, you actually get that food for free. Like, what? Dude, like, uh, dude, Heart Attack Grill. Like, the guy used to be, the CEO used to be a doctor. And then he kept getting people, you know, with, you know, overweight and were getting heart attacks and, you know, cholesterol, diabetes and shit. And he's like, you know what? Fuck this. If you want to. If you're all not going to change the way you're healthy, then fucking I'm going to help you get there quicker. And he just made the heart attack grill. And, um, oh, my God. And his, every spokesman he's had so far has died of a heart attack. 
from <laughs> eating at his restaurant. God bless this man. What is his name? I don't even know. Yeah, I'll Where look him up. Where is he from? Where can uh, Arizona, I, I think. So I can shake his hand. This man is a godsend. He knows what he's doing, man. He wants natural selection to play. And this, it, like, with all the various, you know, so chances it's, that natural um, selection can't play So out. it's in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's, this man's a genius. Not this is in Las Vegas. Oh. And um, I'm going to just... Yeah, that's it's in Vegas. So I'm gonna just look. Uh, the founder is John Basso. So that's the John guy. Basso. Yeah, that's the guy. You know who else is a man that should be revered? Peter Foyken. Peter Foyken. Uh, he's a man from Denmark. Oh damn. Who is six foot seven? Oh damn, he's, tall motherfucker. He was a, like you want to talk about a tall Viking, blonde hair, blue eyes fucking Hitler's wet dream. Like, if he saw him, he'd probably be, like, coming out of his micro dick. Oh, God, dude. Fucking buckets. But, I mean, it, let's not have... Let's take away that image. Now that's in your head. You're welcome. I now, have this in my head. I just have... That um big tower of fucking testosterone. Yes, I... I paraphrased Thotty, too. Because he also made a video on that. But, like, I, this guy... So he was, he was an Arctic explorer. He was also a, um, a scientific author. Damn, a, dude. A, a professor, an academic professor, um, an adventurer. Sounds like me. A hunter. Like he, like, he killed a polar bear and wore its pelt. Dude, this guy sounds like what I wish I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's a, something hilarious. So he almost got trapped... In his, uh, he almost got trapped, like, in his own self-imposed tomb when he was Arctic exploring one time. Um, uh, and he couldn't even turn his head, so, because his beard was frozen. So what he did, he's, he just, he tore his beard off. But, and then also, like, here's another thing. It was so cold, but he was also trapped. So there's only one thing he could do. He had to cut his way out with his own frozen feces. And so he cut Dude, this so he guy just kept slicing his This is what Bear Grylls wish it could have been. Bear Grylls doesn't shit like dude, Les Stroud would kick his ass, but that's beside the point. L like Les Stroud's act this that, that actually might Bear be competition for Les Stroud. Like yeah. yeah, Les Stroud would have a run for his money. Of course, you know, Peter Freuken is not alive anymore because like his yeah. time was like uh, you know, the early 20th century. Yeah, so like the early 1900s? Yeah. Damn. Um, it, like, yeah, he broke out. I'll probably have to do a video to, on him, too, at some point. <laughs> like, out of an avalanche with his own with his own frozen shit, man. His own frozen shit, and he's just, like, using it as a sh makeshift What the fuck shit. are you going to do if you're trapped, though, dude? <laughs> like, if you literally, That's like... That's what he did. It's like, dude, like, mold your shit into, like, an <laughs> axe... And get your ass out of there, bro. I like. I would make sure I'm wearing gloves because I, I yeah. ugh, like. I, I, have, I well, okay. Actually, he could have had gloves. I mean, he was out in the Arctic. Dude, he has to have gloves, or else his fingers would not be around. <laughs> he married a. Also, uh, another thing is because you know he used his shit. You know, <laughs> his frozen shit to like. Literal which I've shit. I've been saying that so many times. Um, he had to uh, amputate his own. Uh, gangrenous feet, because they also got, he also got trench foot from it. So oh, I imagine his, his toes went right missing, but he was still fully functional. He could still walk. Wow, this is how much dude. of a fucking badass he was. Wow, he, dude. And he had to cut him off on his own without any antiseptic. He was only slightly pissed about that, but he was pretty much unmoved. Yeah. Wow, dude. Wow. Like Chuck Norris had like. He looks like a fucking. This makes Chuck Norris look like Boy Scout compared to he, this guy. This it makes it makes Chuck Norris look like fucking Marilyn Manson or some shit. Just like this punch where you're like, ah. I don't know. Marilyn Manson is somehow. He seems he's kind of badass and so. Yeah, well, yeah, but it, would he survive in the middle of an avalanche or some shit? Who are in a forest would not. Yeah, I mean, like that's what I mean. Like he would just like die instantly in the forest. So yeah, look this guy up, Peter Freuken. Um, fuck. I mean. He married an Eskimo woman. Uh, let's see. He uh, here's another thing. He was also involved in World War II. Since Peter Freuken was partly Ashkenazi Hebrew, 
He you know, uh, was doing guerrilla warfare against Nazis, basically. Um, yeah, kind of. But here's the thing. He got captured by the Nazis, but he single-handedly escaped. This is a guy who escaped out of an ice tomb in an avalanche with his own feces. <laughs> Do you think Nazis are going to kick him, you know, like, keep him down? Fuck no. And you know what he did afterwards? He set in a, a resistance movement in Denmark. And then, once they caught him again, he escaped, and then he went over to Sweden, where he would... Okay, yeah, there's the Swedish flag over there. Um, he he escaped to Sweden, because, like, you know, Sweden was neutral at the time. Um, technically. Yeah, technically. Because they were, they were doing trade deals with Germany, too. Right. But they, they, were, they uh, used their neutrality kind of pretty... Uh, um, not controversially, but kind of like, um, kind of bordering on the line of aiding another, uh, wow. aiding the Axis in a way, because they had, uh, they were doing a trades on steel and stuff. They were yeah. given the, uh, German steel, basically. Where he would also work behind the scenes it also to, uh, uh, ruin some of the, ac the plans of the Axis powers. Oh yeah, Norwegians did it too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean... Yeah, like, Scandinavians in general were like, fuck you Nazis, also, you evading our I, shit. Um, I actually got something wrong, though. So he led a resistance movement against the Nazis, then got captured, and then he escaped to Sweden. Ah, okay. But yeah, like, still, that is so badass. And uh, I think he died sometime in the 50s at the ripe age back then that was, you know, living long. 75, I think. Oh, yeah, that's a pretty old age, yeah. Yeah, so he lived a full life for that time. Yeah. And uh, he left a pretty big mark. I'm surprised that people aren't talking about him. You know, they make all these talk Probably tales, in Denmark, probably. But, oh, yeah, he probably is. Actually, here's another thing. Uh, he buried a, another Danish one because, like, the Eskimo woman died, I think, of tuberculosis, I believe. Yeah. Um, and he, al he also, like, left, uh, you know, her some children. Yeah. So there could be some Eskimo people that are actually related to Peter Fricken. Nice. <laughs> so um, here's another thing. Uh, he married another Danish woman, which I think she was like, um, fuck, she was uh, one of the top models for Vogue magazine. But hmm. um, his her parents liked him so much, they allowed him to be chief editor of a, a of a Danish magazine that's currently still, a, you know, like a mainstream um, that's pretty cool. outlet. Yeah, that's pretty cool, yeah. Anyway, uh, gonna uh, uh, finish up this uh, thing with uh, just the last video. Then I'm gonna kind of go into what I think why uh, he probably killed himself because uh, that's how he died. He was suicide, and this is a uh, and this video is from Fox. So I mean, but it, it's um, Anthony Bourdain's death raises suicide awareness. And one thing that I've noticed, at least on the right wing that they like to mention is like mental illness, especially with guns and shit. It's like, you know, mental illness, mental illness is the problem. We, you know, we should probably, you know, treat mental illnesses, which is kind of, it's a half truth. It's a half truth. You know, I mean, not just with that, but it's kind of interesting to see, um, them like the right wing kind of talk about that. I mean, it's even actually outside of guns too. So, uh, you know, maybe they, actually are generally more wanting to have awareness towards mental illness and i think that should be just a generalized thing too i think everybody should just be more aware of mental illness and actually you know work on ways to get that better but we'll just uh, get in this video Death on it anthony bourdain was found dead oh my god this guy in a hotel room in france uh, uh, say he i don't know his life. name but he's i hate bourdain him. becomes the second celebrity to apparently commit suicide this week with ears that to large course he can hear you tells us the incidents bring new attention to a problem experts say is getting much worse Oh, yeah, look at that goodness. Uh, Anthony Bourdain, the larger-than-life celebrity chef with a bad boy persona, traveled the world telling stories through casual conversations over food and drinks for his Emmy-winning show on CNN, Hearts Unknown. Bourdain was found dead today at the age of 61 after hanging himself in his hotel room. He was filming in nearby Strasbourg, France for his popular show. The news of his death shocking his family, colleagues, and fans who say he lived a life many envied with travel, food, and adventure. This is what you want. This is what you need. This is the path to true happiness 
The Centers for Disease Control report suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Wow, so they uh, actually did pull a chart up. I'll pull, I, I haven't pulled up anything on the screen, actually, so I might as well pull this up. Although, you should probably take it with a grain of salt. because. Well, I mean... Uh, this is from the Center for Disease Control, so this is a genuine agency that is doing research on this, so I do believe this. Um, so it looks like organs from 19 to 30 percent, uh, just looking at our local uh, state, but look at all these states where it's just so prevalent, dude. South Carolina, Oklahoma, Kansas, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, huh. D D Dakotas, Minnesota. It's like there's a correlation. I wonder what it is. I mean, with these states... I mean, it, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different correlations to suicide. There's all sorts of different reasons why people do this. So, I mean, and, and it looks like these are 31 to 37%. Huh, right? Nevada's pretty low. Yeah, Nevada's at 1%, like Maybe less than because, 1%. Because, you know, prostitution could be legal and anyone who yeah, I wonder what seem to get laid is I don't, like... Yeah, hey, that's, that's fine. I can huh. save enough money to fuck Yeah, and look at uh, 6 to 8%. Curiously enough, like most of the a lot of the South is like between sixteen to eighteen percent or nineteen to thirty percent, which is actually kind of interesting. I thought maybe well, that would have been a little higher. Oklahoma's pretty fucking high, dude. And South Carolina, but I mean, Kansas. compared to most of the South, though, I mean, Texas is only between this nineteen to thirty percent mark. I mean, that doesn't really surprise me. Oklahoma. Dude, that place is barren as fuck. And who lives in this corner right here? Like this, this tiny little smidge. Like, who lives there? Yeah. Like, do, like, three people live here or something? Because I really don't know. But, yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of a, a, uh, interesting to kind of see where it's all so prevalent. I mean, I know in Oregon, it's definitely... Oh, yeah, it's pretty high. Damn. I Yeah, I mean, all these... I mean, what I can... what To me, what the correlation may be, why it's so high in these uh, states up here, is because there's not a lot of people... And also, there's a lot of Native American reservations, and just think about you know the shit that they go through with high alcohol, uh, high alcoholism. A lot of female Native Americans actually get kidnapped and shit, and oh raped in a lot of cases, and um, and obviously live very impoverished because they live. A lot of them just live on reservations. So I mean, maybe that's probably where a lot of this comes from. Is maybe Native American suicides is in these uh, more northern states here in the Midwest. That could be it. Yeah, I mean, I'm just making a guess. You know, just based on what I know, because I know Montana has a lot of um, Native American tribe reservations here. Um, there's one literally right next to uh, Billings, Montana, where my family lives. It's like maybe 20 to 30 miles south of it. And um, it's a pretty big reservation too. But I've never been there. But I would like to go check it out at some point next time I go up there. But yeah, I mean, Hawaii seems like it's in that 6 to 8%, 18 to too. Alaska is actually kind of strangely high too. But I wonder if that's because of a similar situation with like maybe Native Americans and Inuits. Or if that's just because... Sometimes, you know, with people who live out in the literal middle of fucking nowhere in Alaska, you know, because they don't have any, like, cure to maybe some disease, they maybe see it better to just, like, well, I know I'm gonna die, so fuck it, you know. I want... could be it. That's like I don't know. suicide. Yeah, I mean, I know in art, uh, Oregon, there is a uh, doctor assisted suicide, so I wonder so if that's... That could be a contributing I wonder... factor. I wonder if that uh, is... Um plays a um, factor in the actual suicide rate or if that's just a different thing entirely so i mean it does spark a major conversation just with this alone so i mean i'm this is like one of the few things it seems like fox is actually posted that's actually like non-biased as fuck and retardedly stupid and they partisan probably changed some aspects but it's just really funny how it's like i mean if it's from the scene some of the most religiously you know um led states it's like Utah. they're kind of incriminating themselves here Utah, Kansas, Kansas White, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, you know, like I mean, Oklahoma phobia, I should say. I mean, Texas is South very Carolina religious. Is I mean, this place. whole Southern Belt is very religious. I mean, there is a lot of places where it's very religious that seems to have high suicide rates, but at the same time, it's not. So, I mean, I don't know if religion's maybe the specific case for a lot of these, but 
I wonder. I, I I am really curious why these ones are very low compared to some of these other southern states. Well, it's like Georgia is right next to South Carolina, but it's like there's not a high suicide rate. I mean, South Carolina is literally like thirty eight to fifty eight percent, yet the state surrounding it is in uh, between six to eighteen percent. So yeah, it's so kind like, of what could be the reason. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I do. Have, I have followers in South Carolina, so I'll have to. Uh, if they see this next time, hopefully, maybe they can bring something up. So, Carl Rove, Joe Malloy, my my boys, you guys are uh, from the south, uh, south, and I know at least one of you is from South Carolina. I know that for sure. So, let me know what might be the case of that. Yeah. Or at least, you know, because I'll trust your judgments better than better than my own on that. I mean, because South Carolina is literally an outlier right there. It's really weird. And the yeah, it's very bizarre. But, you know, I am glad that there is awareness. I mean, you know, I'm kind of glad that they did this segment because, I mean, you know, you, if, if they get the right to start maybe doing movements to bring awareness to mental illness... I will actually support them with that. I'll give them credit to actually bolstering up a decent movement. I'll be like, hey, I'm I'm for you. Like, let's actually bring awareness it's to mental illness. It's strange that Vermont is pretty high. I'll yeah, New, uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, uh, those two states are uh, very high as well. Uh, Rhode, uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts are just uh, below that line. And New York, uh, uh, Connecticut, and Maine are um, within 19 to 30%. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, a lot of these states seem you know like... what I find weird? You know, like, there's the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and that's usually, like, called suicide, you know, central. Like, it's, like, the biggest, or it's probably, like, the second biggest destination for suicidal people. Maybe in California. Yeah. yeah it's, like, it's weird because, it you know, it's, like, 6 to 8 Compared to, yeah, 18%. compared to California, uh, compared to the whole country, California is very sm uh, has very small numbers in actual suicide rates. But there's also arrows um, right here. Um, besides the one percent, all of these are going up. So I don't know if that means there's a trend that means these percentages in these places are going up overall on average or not. And I'm also really curious as why Nevada is at one percent or less. I'm I really am very curious as why that is, because that's the only state that I can see that is at one percent or less. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I wonder what the, um, like, there's a lot of outliers that are kind of here. Like, you see kind of a trend of blending, like, Oregon and Washington are in the 19 to 30%. And then you got this northern Midwest just belt of blue. And then you got a lot of these just little chunks of similar percentages. Well, then but then the you Midwest. got these outliers. And then you have outliers like the Nevada and South Carolina and shit like that. And then even, um... Is that New Hampshire or Nebraska? No, that's Nebraska. Nebraska. Uh, Why did I say New Hampshire? <laughs> I would have thought there would have been higher. Yeah, I mean, Nebraska. Who the fuck wants to live in Nebraska, man? Yeah, Nebraska is an outlier because they're at 6 18% compared to their percentages that's higher. Right? Yeah, there's outliers around here. So I'm, it, yeah, I would like. I, I wonder what the detail. Like, I'm sure we can easily pull up this uh, these uh, statistics because this is June of 2018. This is very recent. This is this month. So this must have been uh, a report that maybe just came out uh, for this month, like they always do, because it's the CDC. So it'll be really, yeah. I mean, I'll probably uh, have to check out the CDC and check out uh, this in more detail and see why maybe there's outliers in these, some of these states if there is any information on that. The U.S. are rising at an alarming rate, up nearly 30 percent between 1999 and 2016. Wow! The news so overall, 30, there's been a 30 percent increase just overall um, in the whole country. Wow, man! I mean, that could be some contributing factors. That I poverty. Think. Yeah, it could be poverty. The, um, the um, you know, like the classism, uh, yeah, job outsourcing, like, um, medical that. bills, medical bills, oh, bankruptcy, definitely. debt. Um, also, the schooling system isn't getting any better. Uh, I feel like that really causes a lot of mental illness. For, the like, status quo kids. overall. Like, uh, you know, for, like, high school kids. Because, like, high school kids are forced to get up in this country ridiculously early hours. And, you know, like, teenagers need more sleep. That's true, I dude. think it's, it's more ideal that they get up at, like, 10 a.m., you know, or, like, go to class at 10 a.m., and then get out at, like, 5 or 6 p.m. It makes That's a little bit more sense. Better. Yeah. It also would help if they actually had a school system that gave them, I don't know, like, fucking life skills? 
you know, vocational shit, other than some pretentious teacher, you know, giving them a some stupid seventh grade, you know, pretentious lecture on fucking Catcher in the Rye. Oh my god. Like, how how's Catcher in the Rye gonna teach me to pay my fucking bills, huh? Well, I, I liked Mr. Walker, but it's like, what the fuck, man? I mean, that, I, I... That was such a stupid fucking book. I mean, I mean, there's importance into learning about, like, literature, history, and shit like that, but like, I mean, out of there all needed... the coming-of-age stories, you chose that? Because they, they probably thought, oh, it's relatable to the teenagers. No, I don't find Holden Caulfield relatable. I find him to be a fucking hypocrite. Everyone's a phony! So are you. Of course, he pointed that out, but that doesn't mean it's better. I mean, I mean, I don't know if you were raising a lot of, like, I think, I mean, I wish, I mean, there was more encouragement of counter-arguments, because, you know, you probably yeah. could have made a really good opportunity to be like, hey, uh, I think otherwise, here's why I think so, and, you know, and stuff like that, you know, maybe just yeah, with more, of... yeah, I mean, in high school, we don't really know this shit, you know, totally, so we don't actually, you yeah, you know, we're not always going to be quick course, on the tongue and be like, whoa, hey, say what, this what, to what, Mr. Walker, though. He actually did encourage counter arguments. He encouraged people to actually. Oh, I, I know, loved um, our um, yeah literacy teacher at Walker. He, he was great. Yeah, yeah, he was one of my. People say he was an ass. Well, like, because he's blunt and yeah, he's, he's very blunt. He actually speaks his mind. You know, he's dissident. He's, I've you know there's you I know like I've about fucked him. up in his class a couple of times and that you know. It's, Oh, he calls you out. He calls everybody out. Yeah, he does. He, but you know, everybody I realize. He, but I noticed. And... But I realized, especially after that, he's like, he just calls everyone out. He doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. And he's you know what? I n yeah. And you know, in high school, I probably I was probably in the crowd of like he's kind of a dick. But after taking his class, and then even after high school, I realized you know I respect the shit out of that. We need more of that a little bit. Well, we do. Not in maybe such an aggressive manner, but we need more of that bluntness and calling out of. I also feel like know. he was kind of controlled by the curriculum that he had to teach. I feel like if he actually yeah. had, yeah, I wish it was to more like um our science teacher, to. like a uh, blacksmith, Mr. because blacksmith was also yeah, because he didn't really go by the whole curriculum himself. He like, he did his own thing for the most part. I've I noticed. I kind of had like a love and hate relationship with Miss Pullen because like I could see the you know like the faults in Miss Pullen, but I could see the merits behind her too. Supposedly she uh, used to um. Supposedly, I don't really know if this is true, but supposedly she has like a little secret spot she goes to at the high school and smoke a little bud before like classes I don't and shit. Care about that. I don't either. Actually, that made me respect Poland even more because she would. That basically like, means ahead, that basically means she it. was just a little buzzed while uh, <laughs> she would. And you know, Mr. she Knight, actually, I think did she, that too. Actually, he sense. had a reason too. Yeah, he yeah. had a specific reason because we Just had a, another teacher. Cancer. Yeah, yeah, and he had one ball, one ball night, and um, he was allowed. He was allowed to smoke medical marijuana, and he was allowed to say it. He, you know, the administrators didn't care because they knew he needed it. Mm -hmm. He had every medical reason to do so. So administrators were like, okay, that's fine. And you know, and at this point, marijuana was you know on the stage to getting legalized. Everyone was just okay with it. It was starting to become a far more casual thing, and, yeah. you know... Because at that point, it's like, marijuana was already legalized? I don't think it was totally legalized yet at this point, was I mean, it? it was? Because I thought I th it was. 2014, yeah, you're right, it was. It oh, was. Yeah, it just didn't really boom. So it was, uh, it, it was, you know, homosexual marriage, too. Oh, yeah, I mean, it oh, wasn't no, until it was. after 2015 where the marijuana industry here in Oregon boomed. Um, it, that's, I would say it's around 2015, because it takes a while for these, uh, industries to boom, you know, so. Yeah, it's true, and yeah. they're booming now. Oh my god. Oh my god, like, Colorado alone. Has like, a surplus. Ordained suicide. How much was it? Like, how much money was it that was reported? I don't even know, like, billions. Uh, up it to was billions. in the billions, yeah. definitely. I don't even, I don't even remember, I think, like, 17 billion or some shit? I really don't oh, remember. I it was more than that. Could be. Maybe, uh... I know Kyle Kalinske did a report Yeah, he did a report on it. on it. I mean, I just don't remember the exact number. Comes fresh on the heels of fashion designer Kate Spade's death this week. She hanged herself oh. in an apparent... So this is another suicide, I guess, from Who some other... Hanging suicide to? in New York City Tuesday. While celebrity suicides yeah. catch our attention when people who seemingly have Chris it Cornell. all take their own lives, nearly 123 people commit suicide in the Kurt U.S. Cobain. every day. 
Medical experts say one thing doctors can do is ask their patients flat out if they're in trouble. Are you thinking about suicide? We can't be afraid to ask people that. People think you can't ask people. You're going to give them the idea? Do, do you? You're not going to give them the idea. If you ask them, they may tell you. The CDC's... Yeah, and I mean, if, if you have a patient who's depressed or has obvious, like, yeah. bipolar issues or just... You know, any problems in their lives, I think doctors should, and counselors too, should yeah, ask, yeah. are you, you, you've been depressed lately, are you been feeling suicidal lately at all, and you know, and just, just don't, to, you know, for any remedy. Yeah, and the thing is, they're not there to, you know, you know, ridicule you or nothing, they're there to try to help you. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I go through modes of depression, you know, I was, uh, I've going through. I've never been suicidal, though. I used to, but I've, like, especially smoking marijuana, I've kind of made it myself, like, never go down that path again, and, you know, I... The last time I was probably was around 2015, but pff, fuck, like I haven't thought about suicide in, in since, honestly. I mean, that's three years ago now. So, you know, it's just like, I mean, for people, they are able to have, you know, doorways like me to, you know, avoid those thoughts or at least keep them, you know, terminated out of their mind for a very long time or definitely depending on the person. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, what, like, kind of gets me is like it is sad that like um, what was his name? Uh, Chester Bennington. Yeah, Chester you know, Bennington Lincoln Park. Yeah, you know, like it is sad that he you know took his own life, but is it really surprising? I mean, look at the lyrics in some of his songs. Erase myself to forget what I've done. Damn. Erase myself like. It, it was it's really telling like yeah guys i mean that's and, a cry and for actually help. you know um chris cornell his last concert in seattle you know the th thing about his suicide is that he made that thought up before the show because yeah. he committed suicide after that show and he literally let out his whole heart to the whole show everybody from that show literally said this is probably the best Corn, uh, show with Audio Slave and Cornell West in existence. It was probably like their, the energy was vibrant and full and Damn. you know and pure and um, and everybody was just like was totally you know infused in, with the show. Uh, Cornell was smiling, having the greatest time uh, of his life supposedly. I mean, you know, maybe he was there for a moment. You know, letting it out his heart as like you know I'm gonna do this last show. Make sure that my fans really appreciate, you know, what I've done in the world, and then just gonna do it. And you know, what drove him to do it? I don't know. <clears throat> I know, you know, that's the thing. Who, why? And that's uh, the final little thing I want to get into is about Anthony Bourdain. It's like, why would he do it? You know, because he's traveled the world. He's like, you know, I mean, here I'll actually pull up uh, this thing because this is something that he's uh, talked about when he got his award for. Um, uh, he won an award from the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and um, in his acceptance speech, he uh, talked about Palestine, which kind of put a thought in my head, maybe, you know, traveling the world, seeing the whole world as it is, and realizing what turmoil and what suffering truly goes on, probably you know, br maybe brought him to that sense, because like, you know... Maybe this... he got so traumatized by... Yeah, like, you know, uh, let me go happening. into his uh, shows here, because in um, his show, No Reservations, um, in 2006 in July, he and his crew were in Beirut, in Lebanon, um, doing an episode, uh, and then, literally, the day, there was, uh, the first couple hours, only filming a few hours, the Israeli-Lebanon conflict, or the Lebanon War broke out, hours after they started filming. And it was very unexpected to them, and um, his producers could fly behind the scenes footage of him, and, his, yeah, I mean... It, and it, um, overall, this episode, and uh, he was able to get evacuated with other American citizens uh, in July uh, the 20th uh, by uh, Marine Corps uh, U.S. military forces. But that episode, which aired on August 21st, was nominated for an Emmy Award in 2007 just because of that episode and what was going on and everything. Wow. Which I think also helped him kind of tap into the political atmosphere with using cuisine and food and culture and world travel. But at the same time, 
maybe why he probably did this was just, you know, he was thinking back on maybe, you know, some of his own past of his, you know, regret and maybe a lot of his drug use maybe. Um, but because he did say he quit pretty much most of everything besides uh, drinking occasionally. Um, I mean, it just seems like overall he was... Uh, you know, looking into the world, going all over to these uh, places, and um, just kind of real, you know, notice just like there's no fixing this. We're just the world's getting more fucked. You know, what you know, and I'm up to my age. And it's like what what else am I going to be really doing besides doing this show? Essentially, and he probably didn't really see much of a like much of a what's the word motivation to really uh, go through with just continuing on. Or, I don't know, I mean, I'm just kind of making a speculation on it, but, yeah. Damn, I mean, I wouldn't be that pessimistic, you know, it's like... I mean, I'm a pretty pessimistic person, I mean, there's a lot of people that are. I mean, think about it this way. Europe was almost wiped out completely because of the bubonic plague. Yeah. Europe is and wars, practically too. leading the world economy now. Look yeah. at how far it's gone. And, yeah, I mean, even the, there's been wars that have decimated lands before that have just prospered now, too. I yeah, mean, and that's the thing, though. It's like the human race always finds a way to yeah. actually fight back and adapt. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe this is optimistic, but, I mean, that's what I think. As long as you persevere, as long as you stay tough, you know, you, you, you say fuck you to the face of adversity, you know, and... That, cause that's we did that as long as our race was alive. Yeah, as long I mean, as we existed as a race, you know. Yeah, like I definitely see the understandings, the reasonings behind someone who's pessimistic for sure. Cause I mean, you know, T.J. Kirk, Paul, and yeah. Scotty, you know, the guys we watch all the time on Deep Fat Fried, they're very pessimistic folks, very pessimistic, especially Paul and T.J. And um, you know, it's like you know, I get it, but you know, I think. I mean, it's just like they don't, it's not like they just don't give a fuck, you know? I mean, these people definitely do give a fuck, because, I mean, I'm yeah. def At this point, I consider myself pessimistic and nihilistic about a lot of shit. I mean, I've just been kind of like, fuck every, Not like, fuck everything, but just like, fuck how things are going as the way it is right now. And, I mean, I you know, it's, it's still, I mean, there's still not enough real information as to maybe why there could have been a motive or a reason as to why this happened. But, um... Yeah, I mean, here's a, I mean, on, uh, on the wiki on it, uh, there's a couple things already on death, uh, including a bunch of quotes from other people, too. Uh, Gordon Ramsay, uh, one of, I actually like him a lot, uh, wrote, um, to Bourdain, brought the world into our homes and inspired so many people to explore cultures and cities through their food, which I, like, wholeheartedly agree with, because that seems like what his passion was. And Andrew Zimmern um, is another uh, celebrity chef, wrote, Tony was the symphony. I wish everyone could have seen all of him. And, it's, you know, I wish I knew more about this guy uh, before his death, too, because he seems like he was he seems like such a great dude overall. I mean, I think I could have been like like him and I would have definitely gotten along a lot. Uh, his love of great adventure, new friend. Uh, this is a uh, oh, just CNN, I guess one of their statements his love of great adventure new friends fine food and drink um and the remarkable stories that uh, the, of the world made him unique storyteller his talents never cease to amaze us and we'll miss him very much yeah then there was just them uh even former president uh, obama who dined with bordeen in hanoi in vietnam memorized um memorialized him writing he taught us about food but more importantly about his ability to bring us together it makes us a little less afraid of the unknown Former astronaut Scott Kelly, damn, everyone's just talking about him, uh, described how watching Bourdain's show a while aboard the ISS made me feel more grounded to Earth and connected with us with the common thread of humanity. Wow. And there's yeah. all sorts of awards that he's won here. Uh, was named Food Writer of the Year in 2001 by Bon Appetit uh, mag uh, magazine for his uh, book, Kitchen Confidential. Uh, Cook's Tour was named Food Book of the Year in 2002. Uh, the Beirut episode of uh, No Reservations, which documented the experience of Bourdain's crew in 2000, uh, the Lebanon War, was nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Informational Programming. Wow. 
Um, Bourdain's blog for the reality competition show Top Chef was nominated for Webby Award for Best Blog, uh, Personal and Culture in 2008. And Webby Awards are such a big thing, too. It's like, it's like internet, uh, award. It's like the internet Oscars, but, you know, actually, it's kind of cool. Uh, because you actually do kind of hear a lot about different channels and shit. In 2008, Bourdain was, uh, inducted into the James Beard Foundation's Who... Who's Who of Food and Beverage in America? In 2009 and 11, uh, No Reservations won a crea uh, Creative Arts Emmy Award for Outstanding Cinematography for Nonfiction Programming. 2010, Bourdain was uh, nominated for a Creative Arts Emmy for Outstanding Writing for Nonfiction Programming. Uh, 2012, he was awarded for Honorary uh, CLIO Award, uh, which was given to individuals who are changing the world by encouraging people to think differently. That's, that's cool. Um, 2012, um, no Reservations won Critics' Choice Best Reality Series Award in 2013, 14, and 15. So three years in a row, um, he was nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Host of Reality or Reality com uh, Competition Program for The Taste. And in 2014, Bourdain won a, a Peabody Award for the, uh, 2013 Parts Unknown. And December 2017, uh, the Culinary Institute of America conferred an honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters honors a causa in the culinary arts to Bourdain, who uh, graduated from the CIA with associate's degree in 1978. And it's not the CIA, as in Central Intelligence Agency, it's the Culinary Institute <laughs> of America. So, <laughs> not, not, the, not that CIA. So, he did not uh, go to the CIA. Oh Imagine if there are agents against the CIA and they're like, wait a minute. Does it really make any sense that their headquarters is a restaurant? They look at the logo and go, oh, God, we fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. I mean, he's had a... It's still confusing to me, you know? Like, I, I really generally don't know why. Because he's... He was, you know, he literally kind of went from being just a dishwasher at local restaurants in New York and uh, Jersey to essentially becoming a celebrity with, you know... So Not, we went to the complete polar opposite sides of the hierarchy of the culinary world. Yeah, but he, he but he, I mean, in a way, he kind of didn't expect it because what started it was his book, uh, Kitchen Confidentials, and then um, that brought that brought him to fame and popularity within the uh, culinary world, and eventually got him these shows, uh, and. Um, yeah, I mean, because the Cook's tour was talking about his uh, memoir, uh, Kitchen Confidential, which is about his, uh, um, kind of his, just his memoirs of being um, in the uh, restaurant industry, which I, I kind of want to get, because that just seems like a really cool uh, book, book to look into, because, I mean, I love culinary a lot, too, myself. But it looks like I did go over practically everything at this point, about over on Anthony, Anthony Bourdain. Bourdain. Yeah. Or Bourdain or Bourdain. I have no idea how you actually say the name. Neither do I. I'm just guessing. Too. Yeah. Bourdain, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I'll go uh, actually play this last video because uh, this is on uh, uh, Democracy Now! Kind of about some of his uh, some of his worldview kind of coming out. Which he won I an award from the Muslim Public Affairs Council. This was his speech. I was enormously grateful for the response from Palestinians in particular for doing what seemed to me an ordinary thing, something we do all the time, show regular people doing everyday things. The world has visited many terrible things on the Palestinian people, none more shameful than robbing them of their basic humanity. People are not statistics. That is all we attempted to show. Matt. Those are the words of Anthony Bourdain. Again, Bourdain. died by suicide. Yeah, so, I, yeah, that's what, um, that's how at least Amy Goodman was pronouncing it, which I think is probably actually how you say it, but I have no idea. Well, I guess the best way to find out is how he pronounced his own name. Well, I don't, I haven't heard him say his own name, so, it's somewhere probably. But look at these, look at some of these comments, too. I mean, at least, I can appreciate this guy. Um, rest in peace, good man. Um, made the great spirits easier journey to the afterlife. You will be appreciated, Miss Anthony. You said his name wrong, but whatever. On the war... Oh, uh, here's a quote by, uh, somebody actually I follow on here, uh, Warrior Waitress. Uh, she actually, uh, lives in Oregon, too, I found out. Um, 
She says, Anthony Bourdain on the war criminal Henry Kissinger. Once you've been to Cambodia, you'll never stop wanting to beat Henry Kissinger to death with your bare hands. You will never again be able to open a newspaper and read about that treacherous, provocating, murderous scumbag uh, sitting down for a nice chat with Charlie Rose or attending some black tie affair for a new glossy magazine without choking. Witness what Henry did in Cambodia, the fruits of his genius for his statesmanship, and you will never understand why he's not sitting on the dock of The Hague next to Milosevic. Damn, dude. Damn, man. I mean, I this guy. Be, no wonder man. they. Uh, no wonder they kind of gave him the uh, bad boy celebrity type. Because I mean, this is unorthodox for just common celebrities to say. I mean, this oh, is. Yeah. I he, mean, he was a dissenting voice for sure. Like, if there's legitimate evidence that there may be a plausible murder, I will. I will be like, okay, let's look into it. But it's somewhat. I don't thing. see it yeah. though. I still don't see it at all. There's not enough information. There's I, not I, enough I, evidence to suggest it. I, I would much that. rather say that it, or I, maybe not much rather say, but much rather believe that he actually just commits suicide because it just looks like that's what it all leads to. I mean, or maybe that's what they would do. You think? <laughs> no I'm kidding. Oh my god. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, but. For overall, I just don't think he was murdered. I don't see anybody who could plausibly want him murdered. So, I mean, yeah, he spoke out against, you know, the war crimes of a lot of people. Like, I mean, obviously, Kissinger, what's going on in Palestine. But, I mean, like, what specific care? Like, I mean, who does... There's been more than one person who's called out people like this. So, I mean, to ki like, what would you be doing, like... Making a statement to other people calling out, you know, these crimes and shit that's happened in Cambodia and Palestine and stuff. Like, oh my god, here's another one. Oh my god, another conspiracy. I bet he was murdered by the Zionists. Oh my god, dude. Ugh. He, he, only the good die young. He wasn't young, dude. Some all my Mossad. Who the fuck is Mossad? Mossad keeps getting mentioned. I mean, young for these days, but he was definitely wasn't young though. Yeah, he was almost a senior actually. I think a couple years away from being a uh, technically legally He's a senior. Four years away from being a senior citizen. At yeah. least for the United States. Yeah, I mean, but shit, man. I mean, in Ethiopia, it's probably like you know, twenty nine. <laughs> oh my God. I'm a horrible person. But it's King Salisi, the first. Yeah. Yeah, but. I'm a Bees King Salisi, the first. Yeah, but. I wouldn't be surprised if the life expectancy was. I'm gonna see short. if there's maybe one more video we could probably look into about Anthony Bourdain. Um. Bash Clinton before death. Isaac Green. I don't know who Isaac Green is, but this looks interesting. It's only a four minute little thing. Hey everyone. Oh my god, you look like a freaking like high schooler who Well apparently has a following. Well, I'm not gonna roast him then, never mind. I don't want I don't want the roasts to come right back even though I know I'm not gonna get like roasted back because I I'm a nobody compared to this guy right now. I'm just he will be going after the lowest of low hanging fruit. Like it would just basically be like a it would be like a sixth grader beating on a kindergartner because he didn't give him lunch money. It's like, nah, fam, take my lunch money. I don't give a fuck, bro. Just don't beat me. <laughs> it's Friday, June eighth, twenty eighteen. Welcome in. So Isaac Green will be looking into what he says. I have not. I haven't. I guess heard... it really depends on like how how eloquent his video is. Like, well, what well, is well, the evidence? Or, well, you know... I mean, obviously. Um, there is, I mean, he did date a, an accuser of Harvey Weinstein, and I'm, I'm more interested in the bashing Clinton in before death, so to hopefully it gets school, in pretty... I'm your host, Isaac Green. Just I mean, it's only four minutes, so it seems like it will well, get into the like shit quick. Up, so so my love, like... respect him. Oh, yeah, might as well do the little speed thing. Oh, come on. Prayers to family and loved ones of Anthony Bourdain who has apparently taken his own life at age 61. He had his own show on CNN. He had over 8 million followers on Twitter. He's a famous celebrity chef, Anthony Bourdain. He actually dated a Harvey Weinstein accuser. This woman's name was Asia Argento. It was Bourdain's girlfriend. 
Reportedly, she is beyond devastated about Anthony's death. Not only was he dating a Harvey Weinstein accuser, he also bashed Hillary Clinton before his death. He's reportedly committed suicide. CNN has confirmed. But like I said, Bourdain has lashed out at Weinstein on Twitter. That personal kind of relationship he had with Asia Argento, who was abused by Weinstein. Bourdain called Weinstein a rapist, flat out. Bourdain also bashed Hillary Clinton. Because he kind of is. Clinton as shameful, referring to her interviews regarding her relationship with Harvey Weinstein, who donated 250000 to the Clinton Foundation, and they pocketed that money. Uh, Bourdain said of his girlfriend, Argento, I can assure I you victims of Mr. Weinstein's three decades of predatory behavior are... I mean, he does actually have... He's actually, like, looking over an article here, but oh, the yeah. link is just unfortunately cut off because his cam is in the way, but I could probably easily look this stuff up, too. Oh, I mean, it's, I would love to. I'd love to find that delicious incrimination. Oh. I mean, Harvey Weinstein is considered a liberal, or whatever the fuck. But and yeah, he's not a liberal. Man. He is. Uh, he is um, pretty cozy with the Clintons. So this doesn't surprise me, honestly. I don't. There, I don't think any of that. Just, I mean, just because Bourdain has bashed Weinstein and the Clintons. At least Hillary uh, specifically. That's, I don't. I don't think there's a correlation between a murder and that. But a lot of people want to say he's murdered. So I want to know what Anthony Bourdain said about <laughs> Hillary Clinton. Though. Yeah, I'm gonna look up uh, some of his uh, things. Uh, Hillary Clinton. Um. There's a. It's just a lot of random dudes going in. A lot of random small channels that are just going into it. Um, yeah, it, it looks more like these videos are more conspiratorial. It just seems like oh, it just seems. Just looking at them, it just seems like it. Like boarding suicide called out Clintons on Weinstein hashtag me too. So I mean that seems. I just feel that just. Th and the channel, Holly uh, Seeliger's Zune Politicon, that just oh, no. sounds like a small channel. 14K views, I mean, it seems like a small channel, and maybe a little bit, I mean, I, it's just like, I mean, I don't think it's conspiratorial, I actually just think he did commit suicide, but until there's more evidence to maybe say otherwise, that's, you know, actually being investigated on, maybe I'll actually, you know, look into it, but so far, it just all... I mean, like, if it does turn out that it was a conspiracy, because, I mean, this is recent, so that could be, there could be a possibility that maybe it could turn out that way. Yeah. But it, the chances are slim, but, hell, I mean, we thought that the chances of Donald Trump being fucking elected were slim, but then look how that turned out. Yeah. I don't know. We have to deal with his bullshit over the next two years. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, overall it's just sad that Anthony Bourdain but, I mean, is... If has. it's found out that he died because of a conspiracy, think of how much bigger the progressive revolution become. Oh my god. I don't know, I mean, it's so like, a lot of dirt. people... They got dirt now, they're gonna sling that mud and, you know, monkey feces. Just hope, I just hope all that... Over the fucking I right just hope a lot. All over the far left wing, just monkey feces everywhere, all over them. I just hope that there, I mean, just doesn't get flooded with conspiracy theories and stupid oh, shit. Oh, yeah, that, that's I mean, the one danger, though. I just, you know, I mean, is, I mean I, I'm just going to be very skeptical of this whole idea that he was murdered. That's, that's good, though. You should always have a healthy dose of skepticism. Well, I mean, this is like... I'm still skeptical too. Like, like I am ninety nine percent. I am ninety nine percent sure that it is suicide. Like that's my skept. That's like how much skepticism I have that he was murdered. Like I mean, if there's legitimate evidence, I will. Okay, it's more like yeah. It's more like seventy thirty. It's like I'm seventy percent sure that he he took his own life, but thirty percent of me, I don't know. It's like I mean, the only way that seriously. could have happened, the only way that he could have been murdered, is if one of his. Uh, people who were doing the films did it and he was hired to do it but why would that be the case you know like i mean yeah if he's doing i mean he was doing uh parts unknown I'm, so he's working with the same people all I'm the time that they have more of an autopsy report yeah hopefully yeah i mean uh because he was found dead in a front so it's going to take time for his body to come back into the states to do an autopsy so 
Yeah, um, whenever there is more information, um, uh, next time I'm doing a stream and just talk about news, I will bring up uh, Anthony Bourdain if there's any more information that does come up. Because it'll be interesting to see what the opt if there is an autopsy, uh, what comes out of that. But, um, yeah, overall, it's just sad that he did die. Because, I mean, fuck, man. he just, I, just learning about who he is now, it's just like, wow. Like, he's a very... Why have so many been, you know, like, so many people... Like so many famous people have been die have been like dying of suicide lately. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, okay, maybe Prince didn't die. You know, like from to suicide. Him, to him, that's to me that sounds like he maybe accidentally overdosed on medication. Yeah, yeah, he did. He it was uh, fentanyl, I believe. It was one of those fucking opium poisons. <sighs> yeah, I mean, it scares me then, that uh, we actually have that as a pres prescription for people. Yeah. Yeah, here's a uh, sick. You know, Prince is one of my favorite. You know, yeah, musicians. So, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies, opium. You know, fuck you, just fuck you. Like, if I CEO, if I ever find you, and I know who you are, I'm gonna physically assault you in public. I don't care if I, I don't fucking care if I get arrested. I do not. I could be known as the guy who physically assaulted you, and people would actually fucking rain a parade for me. Because of that, I did not. So fuck you. I did not condone the messages of T gay. <laughs> I did not condone the messages of T gay, or T K. T gay. No, I don't. I didn't mean. I did Homosexual alter ego. Hey, I mean, I, you know, um, yeah. Before I actually end this, I actually do have a little bit of an update for uh the podcast that will be uh, starting sooner than I thought, actually. So, um. I am going to be getting audio equipment. Um, I actually found uh, me and um, Rip City. We went through. Um, uh, we were looking for you know some equipment to actually kind of start this, and um, I found a setup that I could start with at 140, which is considerably cheap actually for what we were all finding. So, Whoa. yeah, the audio setup I'm gonna order soon. So I at least got that out of the way. I mean that's Rip City for you. I mean he always finds hooks us up, bro. Deals, man. Yeah, and also we looked at desks to eventually put it here at some point, and we didn't even have to find stuff to buy. Like we were looking at the free section and found great shit. Wow. Like yeah, so you know. We're going to be this starting sooner than you think, so you know. Um, hopefully, that ends up being the case, and hopefully, ends up it's, it's gonna happen. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm getting kind of giggity it's about that. Robbery, man. I know, dude. Great. Yeah, I mean, the mics, uh, I found, yeah, because we found a three mic setup for only 40 bucks, and we found, um, and we found a uh, audio interface, uh, which has everything I need and want, and a little bit more for only a hundred. So, wow. great deal. And I think it comes with mic stands, too, for the mics. And also, there's extra cables involved as well. So, in case we do need extra cables, we got them. So, Damn. yeah. It's, I mean, and um, when it comes to the computer part, we're, that's the big that's the big thing. Like, that's the yeah. one thing that I really got to look perfectly for. Like, I might actually be able to upgrade the uh, laptop um, and maybe just start that at least. So, yeah. Um, at least it could get started, and then if it works out all right, um, so then the desk adopt can be not postponed, but at least more as a secondary to get the show upgraded later on. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Might as well end on a couple of quotes, because there's a few more quotes I found that are actually kind of, uh, and, I like. Uh, better note. Yeah. I mean, we ended on better note, just uh, talk about channel upgrades, but oh, yeah. here's a couple more. My house is run essentially by an adopted, fully clawed cat with a mean nature. I have at least five of those. And here's another one. I'm not afraid to look like an idiot. <laughs> and you know, I love that quote because we shouldn't be afraid to look like idiots. We shouldn't really care what other people think of us yeah. to an extent. I mean, like, to I an get extent, yeah. potential employers. Um, or just being more potential reserved or just significant mature. Others, like women, you know. Yeah, but that's like, you know, you're looking competent or mature in front of them and mm -hmm. acting that way. Yeah. Um, there's also, you know, like family and friends. I mean, you don't want them to disown you. That would, but that's, that's the only exceptions that yeah. I can think of. Like any complete stranger that I have no chance of ever meeting again. 
fuck them, man. <laughs> like, just fuck them. You know, it's like, you want to say something, say to my fucking face, bitch, okay? <laughs> Damn. Like, I don't care. And if you like me, nice, you know? Like, but just, just know that, like, if you say something to me, I'm not going to care. Right, yeah. So why should you care what I say to you? Yeah. All right. Got one more, and then we'll end, uh, end on this note. Context and memory play powerful roles in all uh, the truly great meals in one's life. Which, you know, I mean, there, I, I have definitely a lot of memories with, you know, in feasts and, you know, joining in on big uh, meals and stuff, so... Yeah. yeah, there's well, a, there's also, a lot of quotes that I kind of am holding dear now that uh, Anthony Bourdain has said. That's also an instinctual thing. Like, um, think about it for a moment. Like, when you're whenever you're eating, how do you feel in comparison to the rest of the day? Better, good, because you get a yeah. little bit of a dopamine. You feel calm, you know, because like, that's the thing though. Like, humans are never eating when they're fighting. Yeah, they're all they all fact, come together. Fights have actually been broken have because of food. Been, because of like some guy just eating, you know, and they're like, they don't even have to like offer them food. They <laughs> just break up a fight by just simply eating around them. Huh? Because like eating it's like an instinctual thing. In yeah. fact, actually, that's why it's good to chew gum when you're working on something because it tricks your brain into thinking that it's eating something. Yeah, I mean, you want to make sure you eat. Like after chewing gum, because then that also is going to make your brain convince your stomach it wants to digest shit. Because I've noticed if I don't eat anything and I start chewing gum, my stomach growls like a motherfucker. It's like, yeah. okay, I need to eat something. So, like, your teacher, like all you high school kids out there, if you're even watching, if your teacher tells you to stop chewing gum during a test, tell them to fuck off. Maybe not in that literal... No, I'd do it anyway. High school's <laughs> bullshit. Oh, Dude, I kind of regret not doing that shit, man. I'm, I'm, I, I don't... I would have... I, I should have told Tim Taylor I to don't. fuck off, man. What? Say, like, Whoa, you know who? what, dude? You bald, who this? And you're jealous of the fact that I still have a full head of hair on my head, man. New phone who dis? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Well, we've been going on longer than I you, thought, you to be principal. honest. You yeah. Yeah, I mean, don't dox him though. Don't dox no, his ass. I don't. I don't dox people. That's that's depraved, man. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, going on longer than I expected with uh, going into yeah. Anthony Bourdain, but You're yeah, welcome. a lot of random different fucking tangents too on top of that. But yeah, yes. but anyway, we'll end this ignorism on that's some nice fault. notes, and then um, yeah, hopefully I'll probably do another stream tomorrow or uh, sometime then. I have no idea when. This other news that I didn't, uh, I chose not to uh, get into yet, but I will later. But anyway, peace out, everybody. You're gonna get the palm of death, cause I, that's how I do shit now, bitch.